Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 456. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norwich, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim. I bring the thunder from down under, so says the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, the Duke of You Know, and the elder statesman of the podcast. How's it going, eh? <laughs> On this episode, we are going to be talking about Superman. We're going to actually talk about action comics, and we're going to be talking about the second issue of Superman American Alien. We're going to talk about Dark Knight 3, Master Race, issue number two, and we're going to talk about the first issue of Lucifer. We also have some listener voicemails. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network, the League of Comic Book Podcasts, and the InfiniteComics.com Podcast Partnership. Sponsoring this episode, once again, is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what is going on at DCBService.com? Bundles, bundles, bundles! We have a really cool special bundle going on on the issue number 50, you know, within the uh, the DC Universe. We've got a bunch of uh, new... Uh, Bunch of number 50s coming out. Batman, Superman, Action Comics, Aquaman, Batgirl, Catwoman, Detective Comics, The Flash, Green Arrow, Green Lantern, and Wonder Woman. All issue 50. Great discount on it. Now, we're dealing with issue number 50. Are they going to give you a 30% off? No. 40% off? No. This is 50, so it's going to be 50% off. DCBS price, only $27.39 for those uh, wonderful titles. But... That's not all. We got another continuing on the new Vertigo series bundles, 13, the 13 issues out there. And once again, 50% off. So you get all 13 issues, only twenty five eighty seven. Over at InStockTrades.com, they've got those deals of the week. They've got Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Trinity. This is the Matt Wagner series. It's 50% off. It's only fourteen ninety nine. Flash hardcover volume seven. Savage World fifty percent off. Only eleven forty nine. That was an awesome storyline. Hellblazer trade paperback volume twelve. How to play with fire fifty percent off. Only nine ninety nine. Uh, they've also got the number one top seller right now is the Green Arrow by Jeff Lemire Deluxe Edition hardcover. It's forty five percent off. Only twenty seven forty nine. So that's over at our sponsors in stocktrades.com. Remember that DCBService.com is a digital partner. If you have a Comixology account or a My Digital Comics com account make sure to link those to your dcb service account shop through their portal and earn five percent of those purchases towards your dcb service order and that's really it adds up very quickly so that's dcbservice.com and instocktrades.com james what kind of a podcast are we Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. <laughs> let's talk some comics. <laughs> come on, Screel. Let's pay these plutonian beam makers a visit. Our first discussion this episode is going to be Action Comics number 48, Savage Dawn Assault. The story by Greg Pack and Aaron Cooter. Words by Pack, pencils by Cooter and Rafa Sandoval. Uh, inks by Cooter and Jordi Tarragona. Uh, co colors by Tomeo Mori. Letters, Steve Wands. Cover by Cooter and Mori. Adult coloring book variant cover by Scott Ta Collins. The assistant editor is Andrew Marino. The group editor is Eddie Berganza. And Superman, of course, created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by special arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family. And I kind of wanted to start with this one first. I was kind of, we were, you and I were talking as I was driving home as far as where we were going to start. And I've been so into Superman lately that I just really wanted to talk about this. Uh, they've, they've done a great job in this storyline of doing what I like the most in really good Superman is getting to the character of Superman, the core of Superman. I don't mind when Superman questions himself and tries to find his role. One of those situations where like life has really taken Superman and turned him on ahead. When you are an all-powerful character like Superman, then all of a sudden you become 
significantly less than that. That's interesting because there's going to be a certain period of time where you're trying to figure out how to fit in. What does that mean for you? Uh, what are your core values? And, and before you can really get to like being you again, the person that we all know you to be, you really have to kind of reflect on what that means in this new role. Because it's easy to be the dun da da Superman when you've got those superpowers, not so much so when you don't. And I really like this storyline because it really reflects on the humanity of Superman and to me makes him far more interesting as we see him build himself back up. Powers or no powers to being that guy, to developing what is my code in this world where people really don't like me. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's kind of a weird kind of place to be in. Now, no fault of his own. It's it's kind of the nature of society in this world. And I really like this exploration of him. It's very interesting for this character. I feel this is tried and true Superman, though. What are, where are you at on this? Because I'm, I'm really digging this storyline immensely. Oh, God, I'm loving this, man. It's, you know what, again... The, you know, I love the da 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 Superman, Me but too. everything you talk about just with how just the uh, the real everyday guy who's just he's got to knuckle up. You know, it's you dig deep. And I and just that opening monologue where he's talking, uh, you know, a massive starship is teleported in hundreds of dead, you know, but I'm still stupid. I'm still yeah, I'm still Superman and I'm never going to give up, but I need to fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did like just again. It's just, a lot of his inner dialogue has been. You're seeing signs of the Kansas farm boy, yep. and I think that is a really cool thing to have us see that, to have us get to know that, and once again remind us that that's who Clark is. You know, Superman. He is Clark Kent. Superman is something he does, and well, now with his identity blown, it's kind of a it's a, a, a mixed up muddled up world, but. He still is Clark Kent. Uh -huh. And I love just how we're really getting to see Clark Kent because we're seeing him struggle through this. We're seeing him, you know, go up against people that he probably shouldn't go up against, but he's Superman. Yep. He's got to try, you know. You know, it's, you know, especially this, like, 48 was a great example of Clark just never saying die. You know, he... You know, he he storms, you know, this, uh, you know, this fortress. He's throwing down with superpowers. He's dealing with the fact that he doesn't have his powers pretty much. You know, it's, you know, but he's still going to keep going. He's still going to keep trying. Yeah, and that's exactly part of the key to it. You know, I, I want to jump back just real quick and not really dispute anything you're saying. It's more of I want to just start with the cover because um, this is one of those covers. I love covers. I love cover artwork and where they're going. This one really struck me. I grew up as a kid with the Supermobile, you know, the Corgi car, you know, in the 70s. And yeah. I, I had that. I, I played with it so much that... Uh, I think I put that thing through every kind of element that you could imagine. It had been in the dirt, it had been in the mud, it had been in the rain, it had been in the bathtub, it had been everywhere. Uh, you know, I was, I was that age when I had, um, you know, not 25. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> no <I> was, <laughs> you know, it was when I was a little kid, and I, I loved the concept of it, which was kind of crazy because, you know, you think of Superman, he's this, you know, all-powerful guy who can, you know, back then he could fly in space and stuff like that with no issue. And, uh, you know, and he had different runs where he could couldn't do that uh, to the same extent, but I always loved the concept of vehicles and heroes. I loved the Spider Mobile when yeah. I was a kid. I loved the Batmobile. Obviously, Batman probably brought a lot of this in, but I loved the idea that they just had these vehicles that were super cool. I wanted to fly around on the Supermobile. Where it relates to this, I got that kind of geeked out feeling when I saw him on the cover with this super suit. It just looks really cool. It's a great design. It looks modern. It looks very today. While having that, I love the S, I love the insignia on it. Uh, it just looks like something like you want to put on and go, yeah, this is cool. <laughs> Other than the fact that it's killing him as he's wearing it, but that's, you know, well, what's a little bit of that between friends? But it just, honestly, the cover right away captivated me with that. I'm like, oh, I, want to, I wanted to read this issue already because of where it was in this particular story arc. This only added to that. Yeah, and it's with the uh, vehicles and all that stuff. And I'm I was I'm geeking along with you when you know when I saw him on the cover because you know he's going to be putting on the armor. You know he's going to have just again a measure of his powers. But I love the fact that he did have some of his powers back. He did have his flight. He did have some of his strength back. But 
The off- offside of that is it was killing him. Yep. It was powered by kryptonite. So it was slowly killing him. He only had X number of time in that suit. And when they first, in, when you know John Henry first introduced the concept, you know, he immediately said, when can we go? Let's start this up. And they're like, hey, keep slow down, Clark. We got to test this thing out. And I love just how, you know, there was never any hesitation in Clark's mind. And it wasn't even just a, an arrogance thing, you know, because Luther's got his super suit, but Luther has his super suit more because of he's Lex Luthor, because he wants to show the world that he is the most powerful, cre- the most powerful human out there. Clark wanted the suit because he knows he needs that to save his friends. He needs that to stop the bad guy. You know, it's there is a really cool just, you know, reason why they're each donning their own uh, suits. You know, it's interesting about this. This does leave up the opportunity when he eventually gets his power back to kind of appreciate who he is as Superman in a whole new way. You know, when, when sometimes when, when the things that are the closest to you, the things that make you who you are in your mind, and you have to somehow discover a way to be without that and then you get that back you appreciate it in a different way you react differently i think this is going to be a great chance to show us uh, a superman who continues to evolve and i find that interesting when you see some evolution of the character this storyline has really reflected that i'm looking at the vandal savage page with wonder woman and, and frankenstein in it right now and i'm just thinking to myself what a great development of a villain behind the scenes i did not see vandal savage coming until he was revealed in this and I really liked the way that these various Superman storylines that have been going on have kind of converged together to this point. It's really some good um, writing from the creative teams involved, but also editorial. I don't know how where this plan came from and how they planned for it to converge like this, but I thought it was really neat the way that it all kind of just flowed together and tied up all these storylines into one kind of neat bow. Oh, God, yeah. You know, Vandal Savage has been the big bad for all of the Superman titles, pretty much, you know, for recent time. And each one, you know, you keep saying, okay, this villain was really one of Vandal's guys. This Vindal- villain was Vandal's, you know, guy. This villain, you know, and you start, when they started pulling everything together and started showing you all that, you're like, oh, that's awesome. And the fact that it's Vandal Savage, when they explain why Vandal's doing this, it's not just about you know, conquering the world. It is about him. It is about that ultimate pursuit of power. He's trying to get more of that meteorite. He's trying to get more of a strong clan that will follow him. It is about conquering the world. But it, there is more to it than just a simple explanation. And when you have more than just the simple conquer the world mindset with a villain, that makes for great villains. It's one of the reasons I love Lex Luthor so much. Vandal has those same qualities now. He's not just this you know quasi-immortal caveman. There is something more to him now. There is kind of, you're getting glimpses of the Vandal Savage. You're getting glimpses of who he is. And also some explanation of the savagery. Because I always took him as being savagery because he's, you know, in in his heart and soul, you know, he is a caveman. Heart and soul, Clark Kent is a Kansas farm boy. Vandal Savage is that, you know, that, you know, Neanderthal person. He is that basic, you know, this raw material of the origins of man. So no matter how old he is, he's still always going to go back to that. But now we're seeing part of it is the power corruption, the pollution from the the energy that makes him immortal. Some of that is kind of messing with his brain. I really like the fact that we're getting fleshed out of Vandal Savage as well as this great fleshing out of Superman. Yeah, have you watched the uh, Flash and Arrow crossover this season? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, we'll do a spoiler warning about this at the beginning just so we don't ruin it for anybody. Uh, Vandal Savage and that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the casting of that. I mean, if you take a look at the guy who's being portrayed in the comic books right now, you could easily have that actor portray this Vandal Savage in here. I think it it just really, that was a great energy there. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. That was a good, that was a very good Vandal Savage. It was, mm-hmm. I like the fact that they kind of meshed a couple of the universes together. They could mesh yeah. the whole Hawkman stuff with the Vandal Savage. And, you know, that way, I, I was kind of like, I was, you know, it was weird at first when they first started explaining it. I'm like, ah, but then you know, you think about it. The TV universe right there, they took two villains, combined them into one, made for a nice flow through on the TV show. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm cool with this. I'm, I'm cool with this adjustment. But And mostly because that character still had that same Vandal Savage feel to him. Yep. He still had that same vibe and that groove. You know, the Barry on the TV show, the Ollie on the TV show aren't 100% what we see in the comics, but they still had that same groove, that same vibe. 
vibe. Same thing with Vandal. Same groove, man. I was I was happy with it. At the core, they got the yeah. character right. And I, that really matters to me when I'm watching these shows. It's really been fun, like as a DC fan, right now to see this great energy going on in the comics, but then it, it bleeding over into these great television programs. I mean, the television, they're really hitting a home run. Everything from Supergirl to... Um, it looks like iZombie is going to be renewed for a third season. Um, we've got Arrow. We've got Gotham. We've got... Uh, Flash, you know, I mean, just, just some great shows. Su- Supergirl, I've just been really... D- <laughs> Supergirl, was, it started off a little slow for me. I don't know why. And then uh, it picked up, and I'm, like, super into Supergirl now. Like, I- I'm into the character development, the storylines there. It's been really a great time for DC television. We got Lucifer coming up. Yeah. Um, it's some great stuff. Is there still a Teen Titans show coming? I don't know. I-, I thought so, but I haven't seen any advertisement for it. Yeah, I haven't either. I'd like to see that, too, um, only because of the fact that everything's coming out. It's been good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's when the stuff starts getting weak that you kind of go, eh, I don't know. But, um, man, they, they, the casting's been great in all those shows. Anyway, back to this <laughs> right now, because uh, I want to talk a little bit about Frankenstein in this. I loved, and it wasn't, I don't think it was this issue, it was last issue, the last issue of the storyline, where Superman first encountered Frankenstein and was reflecting on the fact that normally he would try to talk him down. And he couldn't because of the current situation. I liked that they referenced that. That Superman has to, because of the current situation and everything that's been going on with him, he has to behave a little differently because of that. But I like that he acknowledged that it's a different way of operating than he normally would. Instead of just behaving a new way, if I'm making any sense right. at all. I like the connection to him recognizing this is different than I would normally behave. Yeah, and I like I do like Frank being completely corrupted and you know basically mind control and whatnot. Yep. So it's not so, but you still got that power of Frankenstein, you know. So it, it's again, it was a great play by Vandal, you know, putting all his pieces in place. He's got some that are willing partners, some are unwilling partners, and it's one of those things where you want to see how things are going to play out. You know, it's again. Very, very clever strategy on his part to keep things going and, you know, be the little puppet master that he can be. Yeah, it's a stupid plan. You're right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can't argue with you on that one. It's, uh, <laughs> I I love Superman's saving, like the plane when the pilot's ejecting and Superman's trying to save. The part I like about this so much is because he's so depowered, he can't save everybody. And he has to reference that often, that, like, he's saving this person here, he's saving this person there, but then there's a larger group that is in trouble or dying or hurt badly because of the fact that he can't be everywhere at once. And you can almost feel the frustration in the way that he's talking about it. One of the things that's interesting about the character as he goes through this is how do you desensitize yourself to it. And that's that's a way that you can go. What ends up happening is you just kind of accept it and, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. He doesn't. It bothers him by the fact that he's referencing it. And that's some great writing. I love the internal dialogue in this issue. I just think it's one of the, the prize pieces of this, is getting into Superman's head and just kind of seeing that he's recognizing that things are going on with him. He's frustrated about certain things. Uh, he's still trying to be him, as much of him as he can. And this sense of, you know what separates Superman a lot of times is this sense of responsibility. He needs to get his powers back because he feels like he needs to handle this. It's not just the, like other people be like, I want my powers back because then I'm super strong and I can fly and nobody can mess with me. It's not that for him. It's more of all of the things he wants to do to make things better. That's what makes him the da-da-da guy. That's what does that with Superman. And that's what makes him that guy that you reference. And I really like that that's his driving force in this and that it's really clear in the writing that that's what he's doing and what his motivations are. It separates him from somebody who would be more selfishly motivated. And it'd be easy with those powers to be selfishly motivated. It's one of the reasons why I could never have powers of Superman because I would be selfishly motivated. <laughs> I, you know, it's it's that's one of the things that is so cool about him that he doesn't cross that line and he doesn't. You know, it's like he's depowered. He just you know saved the one person, yeah, you know, the pilot, and then what's he do? 
you know, he's upset that he couldn't save everybody, but he doesn't, you know, let it get him down. He jumps right back to the bridge. He's trying to save people. Bus is going over the edge. He's grabbing it. It's pulling him over. You know, and but he's not quitting. He's not giving up. You know, in the uh, the annual, they showed him when he was pulling the one uh, Lex cor- the uh, Lex oil bus, and he starts pulling it, and everybody jumps in, and together they pulled it. That was a great moment where again showing Superman just you know jumped in there, and everybody else had to help out, and they all did it together and i love the fact that he acknowledged to everybody hey we did all that together people this is all of us not just me and you gotta love those moments i really enjoy the artwork in this book it's it's something that really struck me about this particular issue i i love the background scenery i love the coloring choices i love the character choice you know the character models uh there's Certain styles where it's kind of like, wow, this is a unique style. I'm really enjoying its presentation and everything like that. This book gives me a lot of that. I just really love the sensibilities, really how everything is drawn from the environment to the characters. Coloring is great. It's just it's a really cool creative team on this book. And I just wanted to note that because it is something that's standing out with this one in particular. I'm looking at that page with Wrath where Wrath's questioning Vandal Savage. And you see a lot of background scenery in a lot of the panels and then you flip right in and you're going to a, com- a completely different scenery but i love the choice of the background where the backgrounds you know kind of got a red tone because of all the violence going on in the background and superman's on the bridge trying to save that bus and he doesn't have you know he's like stupid i thought it'd always be superman even though they took all my powers but now there's millions at risk patch of ice and it's you know you can feel his frustration of you know i can't fly if this bus goes over I cannot fly down there to stop it, you know, and you feel that kind of sense of sense, that kind of sense of danger. Then Justice League United shows up. That was great. I didn't expect them. I, I don't know. I guess I should have expected a super team to show up, but that wouldn't have been the team I would have expected to be on the scene. And it was great to reference that, you know, yeah, J- Superman's a part of the Justice League proper. But this is a universe that contains all of these heroes. And why wouldn't they come to his rescue? Why wouldn't they be a part of this? I like when those choices are made in a book to remind us that Superman is part of the greater world. We don't always get to see these characters. I don't remember seeing this team in this configuration interacting with Superman. No, I think this is the first... uh, Well, you look at the full... They've got the full team here. That's what I mean. Yeah. You know, so I think... Yeah, this is... Again... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. And I think that's kind of neat that, you know, you kind of, you know, obviously he knows Steel. He's good friends with him. But the others, they're still getting the groove. They're still getting the vibe. And I liked how it was Stargirl who, with the energy from the star shaft that pulled, that saved him, kept him from going over. You know, and again, it's, this is a team dynamic. And this is the superhero universe. And I was happy to see somebody else come in there. I was happy to see somebody else, you know, step up. And it's, it's kind of neat in an action comics title, in a Superman title, that we get these people in here. And we didn't get like this big, you know, guest starring next episode. No, it's, they showed up because they were needed. You know, you know, it's, again, it's the full DC universe should interact and should have uh, bleed overs into other people's titles. I think that's, that's kind of a cool again it's these are multiple creators telling stories through different titles but it kept the same story going forward and it was kind of neat in the way they did it you know because it's not just you know you know part a here part b here part c there and you got to jump through the titles each one had their own flow each one had their own story and now we're getting the meshing justice league united had their own story in their title now we're getting the meshing in here in two miles away when they go to that sequence and you see Clark and Lana, one of the things that I think has been, I don't want to say lacking in the New 52, it just wasn't developed, was the the childhood of Lana and Clark, you know, their their relationship growing up. I'm not saying that they didn't reference it and they didn't tell stories, you know, kind of building that. They did, but it's different when you know the universe has been this, you know, particularly Superman has been rebooted. And you didn't really get to see that in as much real time as we've had in previous iterations of Superman. These sequences, like when Lana runs up to him and you see the the, the quick banter between the two of them, it further adds to that sense of me, these are two people that are comfortable and known each other for a long time. With everything this guy's going through, 
especially with the fact that he doesn't have this kind of relationship with Lois. It's nice to see it with Lana. It just gives me a sense of, yeah, that's, that's a nice, you know, nod to who Superman is at his core. Again, to the farm, because you mentioned the farm boy earlier. You know, we don't have a rich history with the parents here like we do in the other iterations. So it's great to see Lana be that connection to that life and that person. This is a great handling of Ray Palmer in this sequence. I really enjoyed Ray's use here as a guest. I love that Adam costume. Yeah, that, that's, again, kind of a neat thing, you know, and you think back to how um, Adam looks on the TV show. Yes. It's more of a full suit, and here again, it, it this looks like a scientific-type suit. You think about what he's doing with his molecules and every. I like this environmental suit. I like a spacesuit looking type of in device, especially one that's it's an echo suit ex, ex, yeah, exo suit over his other costume because he's got the one thing, then he activates it and it's kind of like another giant suit over on top of it. So it's he's multiple layered in his own armor. He's got the under armor and then the regular suit and this is a neat look for him. I was, I was, this is one of those costumes that right away, I was like, yeah, that looks cool. I'm digging this. I, I really enjoyed – like I don't know if these designs were created in this issue or by this creative team or not. Their handling of it has been great because I really love this design. I love Steel's design in this. Uh, I really love Clark's uh, that that armored suit design in this. It like all comes together in this book, and I just feel the creative team really does a fantastic job with this. And it's something that I like. I like the the power effects too of the people who are being infected. Yeah, you know, as they come through, it was great to see the power effects play off. There's a lot going on in this in this issue, and. It keeps it moving. I mean, there's really a... Talk about an issue that's filled with a sense of urgency and intensity. It's really this issue. It's just a lot is happening because of the fact that everything's converged. So, you know, you're seeing all these storylines finally coming together. It's the big bad. And I really love that this issue did not let up at any point in time. Clark had a few seconds to hug Lana and then back off and running. Uh, And that's great. It's the Jackie Chan fight sequences. Yes, yes, you know, very good bam, analogy. Bam, 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 kind of <laughs> stuff. And I loved how, like you said, with the pow- the regular everyday people manifesting powers. Because mm-hmm. we, we saw that initially with Wrath, with her powers and how Vandal's been able to perfect it now. But they're not completely going insane, but they're still not completely normal there. That dude's a little touched in the head, you know, who blows up the airplane. You know, so it's, you know... Once again, we have these stories. We've got development for future stuff. We've got this, you know, this massive, massive event that hasn't come to an end yet, which I was like, you know, every every year flip, flipping pages going, man, man, we got more. <laughs> we got more. Each time they get to a point, they're thinking, hey, maybe this is going to work out for us. No, it's not going to. I was like, oh, God. And really great art. I really enjoy yeah. the art. Like, this is a visual treat, like, that really matches the story. I love the joke. Like, Steel tells a joke. Smoke them if you got them. Actually, this is an oxygen-enhanced environment. There's no smoking allowed. <laughs> I love Steel's like, that was a joke, Dr. Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> but then it flips into this great moment where, you know, this is a Superman who we've seen. I'm, you know, having to take a backseat to people because, and, and actually distancing myself from the Justice League because I can't be that guy out in the front. I can't be the leader. Uh, <laughs> I no honest joking aside. I really love the Ray Palmer bit where now that he's got the suit on and we're kind of in this place. They're looking at him differently. You know, this is Superman. He's in there. All right, everyone, from this point on, this is Superman's show. And just like that, I'm flying again. And I just loved the change in confidence. The fact that you would sit there, you know, what was the uh, what was the team? I'm forgetting the team right now, and it's going to drive me nuts. It was uh, a short-lived team that DC ended up purchasing, and we ended up watching them, and they, they were dying because of their powers. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, Thunder. Thunder Agents. Thunder, yeah. Thunder Agents. Thank yeah. you very much. It was so drawing up like it was going to drive me nuts. I really liked that concept of these are people that are, you know, basically becoming expendable because of the fact that they have these powers and they're doing that. Superman's case, he's looking at this has got to be stopped. And the only way I'm going to do this is if I put on this suit. This thing's killing me as yeah. I'm going through. I really loved the playoff of this. Leading into Vandal Savage and his daughter. Again, another great sequence of that where she's like, wait a minute, this isn't what I signed up for. What are we doing? We were, I thought we were really trying to save people and really accomplish something here. 
And Vandal, being Vandal, it's all about him. I One of the things I've always loved about Vandal Savage, when you become an immortal, you become detached. They did a Doctor Who this season. Did you watch any of it? No, most of the I've got most of it on tape. Uh, well, DVR. Okay. Um, do you mind if I spoil something? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. There's a character, and I'll, I'll keep this very, very gentle without ruining anything. There's a character in it who becomes immortal, and you see this person gradually lose like your normal human traits of uh, a sense of compassion and, and different things like that, and, and really this this person becomes very disconnected. They become almost alien. Vandal's like that, you know, and I really like the writing of Vandal when he's handled in this way. Because he's lived so long, his concept of mortality, his concept of caring, his emotional concepts have changed drastically because of it. He's very self-driven and self-motivated because everybody else looks like a ant to him. And a lot of that's due to their, you know, you people aren't going to be here for, you know, like pets. You know, it's like, I love my dog, but you won't be around. <laughs> it's, you know, that kind of concept. And I really like that. I mean, I, and I, I have two cats and I adore them. I'm, you know, a pet person. But there are people like that where it's, you know, you can just kind of detach yourself from creatures that you consider less than human. Yeah. And he treats people that way. Well, you know, a lot of the really cool vampire stories will have that. Oh, yeah. Where when you get the really old vampires that they just look at humans as cattle. You know, it's like, do how do we feel about cows? Are we really that, you know, worried about how a cow feels or are we just want a steak? You know, and that's how, you know, they look at humans a lot of times. And then you get the some who try to cling to that humanity, try to cling to what is right. And it's there is, whenever you're dealing with that whole immortal stuff, that is a tough, tough road. Highlander had some really cool stuff with, you know, with the TV show and with the movies where they're dealing with the immortality. Just the, you know, you, to say to live forever, but, you know, it's the who wants to live forever. You know, it's mm-hmm. kind of a that's kind of a tough thing to do, especially when. Everybody you know will die. He'll watch, you know, people who started off as a, a little kid that, you know, looked up to you as a father figure, then they became your same age. Then you watch them grow old and die. You know, it's, you know, there can definitely be some effects happening. And I, I again, some of the neat stuff with Vandal showing him, you know, throughout these, throughout the different titles, showing him through the different time periods, dealing with, you know, basically brushing aside an emperor. For to speak to the you know the scientist to speak to the astronomer who can help him maybe track the uh, who can track the uh, the asteroid pieces coming you know down you know and just you know those are the people he didn't he doesn't need the accolades he doesn't need the praise from the emperor he want he needs the scientist guy he needs his brain somebody that he can maybe have a slight conversation with yeah and that stuff all I eat that up I mean it's just really fantastic and and it fits totally this story. This bit where they're flying in to basically the assault on Vandal's ship, really awesome. Yeah. Superman's kind of leading the charge, incoming, watch yourselves, target lot. And, and he's leading everybody in for this squad-based attack where Vandal Savage is like, I've got you guys aren't going to stand a chance. I love that the team had a way to handle that. And they were using Ray's powers to shrink and then pop back up. Really unique way of handling this. This was a great assault and a great use of this team. I love seeing Animal Man's powers in full use. <laughs> I became an Animal Man junkie with that Jeff Lemire series. So it's great to see that character still being used in the DC universe. And and I hope that, you know, wherever the Justice League as a concept goes moving forward, that we always get to see some of these quirkier characters. Because I love seeing this new Adam Strange and... You know, I, I don't know. Is United one of the titles that's uh, we're losing, or is that going to be sticking around? I thought we were losing United. I thought so too, and I, I like this team. I just I know. It's... Oh, I definitely like this team. And here's something that I didn't catch my first read throughs, but I caught it on the art. My art read through was you know the where they shrink down and then they pop back up in the sit- ship. Those great sequences. But if you look when they're first popping up, you can see Lana's in the mix. 
I didn't notice her the first time I was reading through when I was first reading this. Because one, you know, when you're first reading through, you're focused on the word, you're focused on Clark coming through. It's like a really cool thing. But she's right there in the background with the the rail gun, yep. you know, just you know, fighting right alongside him. And I was like, hey, that's cool. That's awesome. The fact that Lana wasn't kept left behind, wasn't say, okay, you stay here. No, Lana, you know, armored up. She grabbed her big gun and she's rocking right alongside him. I thought that was a really neat thing. I was glad to see that. Yeah, I think so, too. I think that was uh, really a neat show, especially with how they've written Lana in the New 52. She is independent, and she's one of those characters that I wouldn't be surprised to see her pop up in that. We've seen Lois Lane uh, portrayed in similar ways in in various versions of her, and it was great to see Lana portrayed like that because I think it really fits the New 52 handling of this character. Oh, yeah, big time, especially because you think about this throughout all the different times she's appeared in the comics, you know, whether it's she went down with Clark into the subterranean. She dealt with the the craziness in Smallville. I love the fact that she had that, um, you know, she kind of had that resentment sort of anger towards Clark because he couldn't save her parents and her parents died. I thought that was a kind of a, a neat thing. And even just showing them kind of resolve their issues and then her and steel getting together and just how everything just started going through with that. It's she's not a, she's not just the, the girl from his past. She's the girl from the past. Who's also very firmly part of his present and going to be part of his future, not as a love interest, you know, but that is that long time old, you know, school friend, grown up and matured relationship. And I love seeing that, you know, once again, if you're going to be friends with Clark Kent, if you're going to be friends with a person who has godlike powers, granted not now, but he did, if you're going to be a friend with that person, you've got to have that personal strength. You can't be a, you know, a little whiny person or a weakling. You've got to have that personal inner core strength that just comes out. That's why Lois Lane was always the great match. And, you know, this Lana is an awesome pick. You know, Olsen, the way they're drawing, you know, the way they're creating Olsen's, he's a lot stronger. There's a reason he is Superman's best friend, because he's got Superman's back throughout it all. It's There's a lot of cool stuff they're doing with the, the Superman supporting cast. Siphoning the energy from Wonder Woman now, too. I love the bit where he released her, and she realizes, no, and neither are you, that suit. She recognizes immediately that that suit's killing him. And I really like that about her and their relationship. I want to see these two wind up back together at the end of all this. I don't see it happening, but I still want to see it. That moment was, you know, that even the eyes locking. Yeah. In that moment, it's like, oh, I want to see that happen. And I hope we get it out of this. I don't know that we're going to, but I want to see it. I I agree with you. I'd like to see it. Yeah, I love, I really do dig the relationship, but I think, I really think the relationship is done. I think it's just that strong friendship and mutual respect. But I think beyond that, that's now gone. You know, and even when Clark gets his powers back, I still don't know if they're going to be together just because of, you know, you know, you think about just, uh, you know, just how the how their relationship has played out, how everything has gone on between the two of them. I think Clark realizes he can't have a relationship with Wonder Woman. Yeah, I don't know. I, we'll have to see where it goes. I, I actually, yeah. I want to read the stories. So, I, I mean, yeah, again, yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know that I'm not really going to dispute you on that one. It's I'm rooting for them though. I'm I'm Team Clark and Wonder Woman, so I'm all for that. Wrath finally attacking her father. Yeah, because that was a great sequence. Because there, you know, Star Girl's like, "Hey, don't panic. Maybe this could be a good thing, or not." Bam, <laughs> and he drops them. But here, here's the interesting interesting thing. That's you cool. Know, what, one of the things I've been kind of looking for, and I haven't been able to see him, you know, in the background. Whenever they show the heroes being contained and locked in and being energy drained, yeah, I don't see any image of Luther. And I've seen a couple of the different heroes and a couple of different titles, but I've never seen Luther's image. Part of me wonders if did Luther just you know double cross the Justice League? Because you where, are you, whole talking, sequence, wait, where are you, you talking know, about? Like in throughout this issue, throughout. Um, the um, Lex wasn't and, with you in Justice League United. No, not just no. The pre, okay. Whenever they show any of the heroes being contained, you know, like in the very beginning of this issue and the other issues that they've showed throughout the where the Justice League gets taken down, mm-hmm. I never see Lex's body actually being strapped into the machine. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm looking at those sequences. You see Wonder Woman. You see yeah. Green Lantern. Well, that's because he doesn't have superpowers, dude. But. 
they strap Stargirl, they strap all the other non-powered just the uh, Justice League United people in. Because you can see the one sequence where, you know, uh, you can see clearly that Stargirl strapped in and... I'm assuming Animal Man's about to get strapped in, right. but they're they're attaching everybody else to the the system. You're right. You're right. I'm, I'm looking through. I'm just looking to see if there's somebody. I even checked out the other issues, seeing if I could figure out. And you know, part of me, because you think about it, just how where this thing led into, because we had the annual where it led into where the Justice League first went to respond. You know, Lex sent out the all points message, but didn't invite Superman and kept blocking him out. Just kind of in, you know, when I'm first reading it, you're like, okay, Lex, yeah, you're rubbing it in, you know, and just twisting the knife, trying to make it hurt. But then when Clark started trying to access just power armors, just any armor at this, you know, going, you know, basically going, trying to go into the armory to take the villain power armors just so he could throw it on and lend a hand, Lex kept blocking him. You know, and it was kind of, I was like, you know, he kind of got the notion. I wonder, did Lex just, was this Lex's double cross of the Justice League? I'm just looking to see, I don't think that Stargirl has separate powers in the New 52. I think it's still the staff, right? Yeah, yeah. So, oof. I like that. That's cool. Like, So I guess it drains people whether they're, do we see Lana being strapped in? Um, I did not see her getting strapped in, actually. You see them going down. Right. And, and we don't them. see everybody getting strapped in, so I mean, right. there's a possibility there's some you know other people from right. the team. I I'm just curious exactly. to know more about the drain, in, drain on that. huh? Yeah, I'm hoping this is going to be how Clark gets his powers back. Because yeah, I've enjoyed him without it, but I do miss super-powered uh, Superman. Yeah. I'm excited for like, this, the ending where you see the two of them. You now have every, have everything you need for the final strike, Lord Savage, and you see Clark and uh, Wonder Woman laying there on the ground, and it's going to lead to you know them in their next issue of their book. I oof, yeah. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> I, I am really one of the things I think that DC is doing really well right now, and I've referenced this before, is all of their titles are feeling like events. Yeah, this is a huge storyline, and I like that it built over time. I like that there were stories that were ind- seemingly independent of each other that converged. I think that's awesome. Uh, I love what's going on in the Green Books, you know, the various Green Lantern, Green Arrow, all that kind of stuff. Everything feels like a big event to me. This this storyline in particular, I can't wait to see where it goes. I like the the gradual build. So I want to see Superman get his powers back too. I'm like ready for that, but. I'm content to see wherever they go with this storyline. They're delivering the kind of Superman storytelling I really like. I love, really, this whole armor suit with the uh, shield on it. <laughs> it, it and to me, it'd be funny. They could keep that for around for a little while, figure out a way not to kill him with the kryptonite. You know, in, but again, it's, I don't know, I, I the way everything's pointing, since especially since we were pretty much 100% convinced that it's Vandal Savage who caused all this problems for him. He's the I one agree. who actually led through. He He's behind Hoarder. He's behind all this. He Vandal is the one who drained the powers and did whatever he did. So if Vandal did all that, it can be undone. So whatever tweak he, Vandal did to Clark's DNA to prevent him from absorbing energy back into... You know, because that's the whole thing. Clark's body can't absorb the energy anymore like he did. Vandal did something to him. Whatever was done can be undone. So I'm thinking we're going to get Clark back. We're going to get the Superman back. Yeah, I hope so. I can't wait to see what ends up uh, happening with where the storyline goes. It's a fun storyline. It really is. Anything where you kind of go, this has gotten me excited. See, you know what the funny part is? This has me excited for Superman now. It has me excited to read him when he gets back to full powers to kind of yeah. see how he is afterwards. That's a good storyline when the end effect is going to make you excited for where it goes next as well. Uh, I'm content to just enjoy this ride as it goes along. It's good stuff in Superman. You want to uh, talk about that American Alien book? Oh, yeah. Our next discussion will be on Superman, American Alien number two. The writer is Max Landis with uh, Tommy Lee Edwards, illustrator and uh, variant cover as well. Uh, John Workman as the letterer, Ryan Sook on the cover. Brittany Holzer is the assistant editor. Alex Anton as editor. Superman, of course, was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by a special arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family. I've only got one thing to say, Jim, and then you can really just take over. I am a great food. I eat the window. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That is awesome, man. You know what? I'm 
I'm really digging this Superman story just because too. it's we've got so many different variations of Superman out there. You know, so a nice, cool Elseworld Superman story. I didn't know where, how to take it or how they were going to deal with this. And when, like, within the first issue, when you start seeing all these different people know about the secret, I was like, I don't know. That was always a thing where, you know, I kind of like the fact that people didn't know Clark could do this stuff. And I like the, the, the mystery behind where you'd have to come up with a weird story behind it. Well, now people know he can fly. People know this, you know, and it just like, hey, but they're keeping all the information contained in Smallville. It's a, it's kind of a neat thing where, yes, you have this big information. Yes, you have this big story, but because of the community, because of the sense of that, they're not just going out and blabbing it out the world. They're not throwing it up on YouTube. They're not, you know, selling them out to, you know, the crazy government agencies and whatnot. They're, you know, kind of keeping things contained, but they are keeping it with the grain of salt going, okay, is this still Clark Kent? Is this still one of us? And I liked how he's got the support, but he does have that questions and he does have that What's actually going on here? Where where are we at with this? I, I really like that nice blend of the two. Yeah, I do too. I, I think uh, that part's great. I like that he feels very human. Uh, he makes mistakes like normal human kids would. He's got parents who are trying to teach him a code. I like that they're a little not sure how to react to the fact yeah. that he's got these certain powers. And they've got to keep things under wraps. And they're really trying to protect him. And he's this kid who's kind of like, but I can do these things. I want to be able to do them. He's a teenager, and he's really written written really well like a teenager here. Uh, th- this is almost like a hybrid between um, Smallville, you know, the actual Superman storytelling I read when growing up. And it feels very current and contemporary today, which I really enjoy. You know, like Smallville now, it's, there's been actually a little bit of distance between Smallville's release and you know, the now. So it's kind of great to see a contemporary version of this kind of storytelling with Superman, where it's clear that this is not our guy. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. know, he's, he's definitely your, your else world's example is perfect. I really like this kid though. Like I, I was actually kind of sad that this is only a seven issue thing. I'd love to see this continuity continue. I hope it's successful and they do another one. Oh, ho- definitely. Hopefully, you know, and it's, you know, you kind of want to see him. Well, one, we're getting some great stuff with him and Lana. You do see that little romance. You see that yeah. bumbling idiot of a kid and you see his buddy, you know, Pete Ross, you know, and I, I like just the kind of that, that competition between the two of them, but it, he's not being a jerk about it, but you can tell there's something. Kind Isn't of, he? What? Isn't he? He kind of here. Here's where I'll take it. I think okay. I think you're right to a certain extent on it. I, I should probably clarify. I don't think he's trying to get in Clark's way, but he's not also recognizing that like dudes having a moment, you shouldn't get in the way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of those situations where he just does anyway because he's Pete. I don't think he's malicious with it. I think you're right on that, and I think that's maybe where you're going with it. And I don't I don't really have an argument with you on it, but yet. If I'm Clark, I'm ready to punch Pete because <laughs> he was ready to have a moment there. Well, I think part of it is also you think about when you're always at that point where you're ready to have a moment, ready to have a moment, ready, and you don't make that step. You got to do that thing. It's the baby bird rule. You got to kick them out of the nest and see if they fly or they fall to their death. I, and to me, I'm, I look at Pete as the guy who's trying to kick Clark out of the nest, who's trying to get Clark to actually, hey, dude, take that next step. Quit, you know, you know, fawning and trying to, you know, you because know, he's basically just taking the uh, the French lessons from Lana just to try to get closer. Well, you know what? You've had plenty of time. You got to make the move, and that's part of the things I liked. Where you know, when they had that whole thing wait, with the wait, revving the car wait, and all that. Wait a minute, revving the car? How is that pushing him out of the nest? You're not going to follow that up. Once you're interrupted by the vroom, vroom, that's going nowhere. Well, I think it's the, hey, Clark, you got to start doing stuff. I don't think it's a, I don't think it was a malicious. I think this is, you know, and you know, because you think of it the very end of that, you know, where, you know, Pete, you know, Clark's like, hey, I'm going over there. No parents. You know, she invited me over tomorrow night. Say what? No parents. Stone Cold Clark, you are Stone Cold. You know, right there, you see that recognition and acknowledge. Okay, Pete's like, good, good job. You know, kind of. So I, I don't think it was a trying to. You know, Clark's had those moments plenty of time where he never did anything. That was Pete just saying, "Dude, you know, you know, the, get it going." Vroom vroom isn't going to help him get it going though. 
Room, but room, it, room, room's getting you punched. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm not saying it's the greatest thing in the world, but I no, do. It's think... not even. A, it's not even. It's not even a four. It's a, you're getting punched. <laughs> <laughs> I've had people do vroom vroom before. Yeah. <laughs> They're getting punched. <laughs> but the next time you were with that girl, you didn't wait, you know, and delay. No, you took the, the initiative. Hold on, no, no, no. Because you Here's didn't what, want to get it. No, 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 no. Correction, it did not go that way at all. You're completely misconstruing what would have happened. Here's what would have happened, Pete. I'm going on a date, and before I go out on my date, we need to have a talk. Here's what you're not <laughs> going to do on my date. You're not going to come over and vroom vroom. <laughs> it's just not happening. <laughs> It's it's not going to affect how the thing went with Lana. Clark was being cool. With, actually, I have there is Clark was smooth in that moment until Vroom Vroom showed up. <laughs> Vroom, See, Clark Vroom Vroom and I smooth, are having a talk. But here's the thing: Clark was being smooth, and I'll give you that. That was a really good thing. But you could tell, and especially the way the Clark conversate Clark and, and Pete conversation was afterwards. You know. Clark's been smooth. Clark's take it to that point. But some eventually you gotta take that final step. You gotta make that final move. You gotta actually do something, not just lay the groundwork. You dude, gotta actually take the dude, shot. He was invited to her house with the parents out of town. What move does he need right now? Well, I'm assuming he you know, this is something. Vroom that's Vroom been going did not cause Vroom dude. Vroom did not cause that. But okay. The whole Lana Clark thing has been going on for a while. Where okay. Clark hasn't, you know, actually made that move, but, so I can see, dude, you know. dude, dude. Okay, can I borrow your shirt? Lana invited me over tomorrow night. Right. No parents, dude. What move does he need right now? Well, and that's why Pete's that, like. Stone that's cold, not because Clark, of, that's not Stone Cold right there. That's Pete, the Pete did not giving him the fist. You're trying. Saying, you're trying to give to Pete way more credit than you should. Pete was being a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving Pete way too much credit here. Clark and Clark's procedure for handling this situation worked. <laughs> That's a wait again. Lana invited me over tomorrow night. No parents. Victory. Life's good. <laughs> Pete did not help. We're at that point. I'm Clark. Pete and I are having a talk. <laughs> the talk being when I'm going over to her house, Pete. Vroom vroom better not be anywhere, or I'm coming out with baseball bat bat. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's, that's the way that's going down. I mean, it's just it's the case. Pete was totally being a butts there. <laughs> I'm defending my boy Clark here because he was <laughs> smooth and everything went just fine. Uh, he had a couple. Honestly, in the artwork, the part that I really loved, they had that sequence where, um, can you show me the way home? And, you know, she's smiling, looking at him, going, I guess you were paying attention. There's, like, that kind of little flirtatious, you know, talk between the two of them. I really liked how that all played out. Even with Vroom Vroom showing up, she invited him over. Yeah. So he he made the move, and life went really well there. Um, Vroom Vroom just interrupted. (laughs) (laughs) Pete's stone cold. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, you know what I liked about that? And it's one of the reasons why I love this debate that we're having right now. These characters felt so real in this yeah. sequence that you and I are trying to wrap our heads around them. Pete felt like the guy, like you're kind of defending him and kind of looking at Clark and kind of being like Pete's riding buddy there. But I'm Clark's other riding buddy, and I'm looking at Pete going, no, no, Pete needs to be like, we need to play a game of punch buggy with Pete. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no cars. <laughs> and you'll remember there shouldn't be a car when I'm out with Lana, Pete. <laughs> I I like the whole sequence with the uh, store getting robbed. That was beyond robbery. That was a manslaughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it oh, just that's just wicked, nasty. And again, you know, it's I, you know, it was a really cool usage of that one single panel coming in. You can tell these aren't just this isn't just a robbery. There's something more here, especially mm-hmm. because of the fact that Owen, what are you doing back in the bam, 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 bam? Okay, people, let's you know. And it was just like wow. You know, you re- you see the stone cold killing. You you can tell. Okay, these are some nasty, nasty people, and I love the you know the innocent people are there. You know, oh, this isn't going to go well. That's funny. 
So we get to the we get to the house. Of, we look at it, just say it. We like recorded that. Oh, this isn't going to go well like three times because we kept <laughs> sneezing in the background. I sneezed, and my wife sneezed. <laughs> so you better say that again. We're trying to make it seem natural, like that was the way it went. There's no way that sounds natural. <laughs> no, there's not, it sounds very unnatural. It's kind of like your that's your vroom vroom moment. It's unnatural. <laughs> <laughs> Clark showing up at that house and having that moment where we kind of see some of Clark's morality. I like that this is more grounded in reality, and this only works in Elseworlds. You mentioned Elseworlds earlier, and this is what I really like about Elseworlds. I have no illusions. This does not take place in the DC universe proper. So now we're playing with, this is a kid who's raised by good parents. He's got some moral values. He sees what's going on here, and... Because of his world and because he's like this teenage kid who's kind of like, I can't tell on people, but this needs to be stopped. He goes and shows up in this sequence, and this turns into this whole violent fight. Clark having this situation where when he's shot, there's actually some blood. Um, I don't know if this is because he's young and his powers haven't fully developed or what's going on there. I really liked that presentation, you know, where it's... This is Superman. He's definitely different than your normal human. He's getting up, which is shocking people. But... Things are really very, very different. Then the heat vision kicking off after the multiple shots was mind-blowing. The guy's arms being blown off and it turning into an escalated situation. What I like about this is, you know, you and I are, are both big fans of police officers and the training that they go through. And when you get into people that deal with extreme situations that require mediation, that requires t- training and a skill set. Clark wouldn't have that at that age. He wouldn't have had any of this kind of training on how to deal with a hostage situation and people who are just ready to let go. And on top of that, he's got his own crisis going on with his powers kind of unleashing, and he can kind of control them, but kind of not, With by the fact that I don't think he really intended to take those arms off, other than the fact the guy kept shooting at him. That, to me, I read that whole thing as a sudden you know, onslaught of power, zero yes. control over it. That was an, it was a, he, not only did he not intend to take the guy's arms off, he didn't intend for the heat vision to fire. Yeah. It was complete just, and it was just that whole raw emotion that he was going on. Same thing, like, you think about it when he not, he, you know, backhands uh, Owen through the wall, you know, that's, you know, that was him just, again, not in complete control of the factions, you know, again, granted, he just got shot in the head, so I can kind of, I'm going to give him a pass, you know, for not having complete control over things but this was a great sequence because clark in a way was shamed into going there because like hey you know if you know something you got to do so you know his buddy because his you know this is you know one of his friends one of his confidants whose family are the you know are on the uh were you know killed by these people so it's kind of a you know, yes, Clark wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to stop them, but it was also part of a, I, I can't use my powers. I can't show people. I gotta, I gotta keep hidden. But it's, you know, it was weird, just the emotional roller coaster that Clark went through with this. And I like seeing, you know, especially a lot of the, the pages weren't written. There was a lot of visual stuff with very little dialogue. I think that for me had to add it to the power of the sequences and that, you know, you're looking and you're just inferring, trying to, you know, just trying to figure out what he's thinking just from what you're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that one. It's this, this storyline was, I think in the first issue and the second issue, what really struck me about this one is how grounded in reality it really feels. Like sometimes the Kents are portrayed as having kind of this natural sense of understanding at what Clark's going through. Like almost, it's almost effortless for them to be parents of Superman. Yeah. I like this exploration because it's not. Yeah. <laughs> and yet they adore him and love him and they are giving him the good values, the rich values that we know him to have, but it's not an easy journey with everything that's going on here. And Seeing just just the whole battle and Pete Ross showing up. I like the friendship between Clark and Pete. So everything that I said earlier about, you know, Pete and I are going to have a little talk, I still stand by, but I actually, one of the things that you love is in those moments you see like, okay, that's why Clark's his friend. That's why they hang out together. Because Pete's a stand-up guy. Pete was there for his buddy. And... You know, that's why those things played off and happened. I like those moments because it's really important when you portray a character like Pete as a putz during those sequences <laughs> that you show later why is that friendship even a thing. And that's why. 
and and that's why there's some lo- sense of loyalties and a sense of value there. And I really liked how that was written. Yeah, and I liked how you know the sheriff is covering for Clark. The sheriff knows about Clark's powers, and I love this these moments where when they're in the prison and he's showing him the artist sketch, the uh, you know the description that the the criminals gave. A de- you know, demon, you know, the demon looks like this, you know, you know, and it was really neat that it really showed why they didn't see Clark, why Clark's secret identity isn't revealed yet. Only the people who know Clark has these powers know about this. These outsiders wouldn't know that. But I like that moment when the sheriff goes, why didn't you come to me? I asked you for help. You and Pete. You and Pete both could have been killed. And that was just that kind of a cool moment of the, you know, just between the two of them where he's like, hey, you know, dude, you know, you got to do this. You know, you know, I, I, it's it, he still has that support for Clark, but there is that little bit of trepidation. There is that fear. The doc had to set his nose with a ball peen hammer, you know, and it was just all these different really neat things where they're like, we got your back here. But, you know, you kind of look like a demon here. You got these powers. We had to use a hammer to reset your nose. And I like how they're supporting, but they're still kind of leery of this. The parents in that whole conversation, um, his his argument with mom, I yeah. thought was great. And what she said, I thought was great. Because, you know, I think you all, everybody says things in anger that they don't mean. I'm guilty of this. I've done this before. I've had arguments with my family. I've had arguments with my friends. Where in the heat of the moment, you say something and you're like, oh, man, what did I just say? And it really is. You talked about emotionally being driven earlier for Clark. Uh, I think this is another example of you're just emotionally driven. That happens. And, and you've got to backpedal after that. And, and you realize that, like, wow, I cut a wound pretty deep there yeah. um, by, you know, the dumb thing that I said. Uh, but th- that is all driven by emotion and passion in that particular moment. And I really loved the writing of that and how natural it felt, considering the story that led up to it. And it's a parent who's, she's scared for him. And at the same time, she's angry that that situation even happened. And there's so many mixtures of emotions that you read off on that page. But I really loved how real she felt. One, I think I have a great affinity for Ma Kent just because so many great stories have been written, including, remember that Superman Returns Um, one-shot? Ma Kent, I thought was really excellent. That was an uh, Andrako-written one-shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been so many great Ma Kent stories and Pa Kent stories throughout the years, but it's a character who I really just like a lot. And when they showcase her raising Clark, this is the separation between Superman and Batman as well. It's... Bruce loved his parents, and his parents were around a decent part of his childhood, but he never got into his teenage years with his parents. Yeah. Uh, and it's a very different experience that leads to a bitterness that Clark never had. And the reason why Clark didn't have it was because of this. They got to be around longer. They got to give him values and, and keep going with them in situations like this. And I really love when these sequences play out because I love Batman. I'm Batman's my favorite character of all time. I love the separation, though, of what makes Superman so unique. And it's this type of stuff. And it, these are characters that really matter to me and, and are just as important because of that. Yeah, it, I, I especially like the ending here mm-hmm. with the mom kind of... She was going to say, don't do this, but now she can't. She's starting to understand Clark may need, you know, this is kind of, to me, I'm seeing this as the birth of the, you were put on this planet for a bigger reason. There's, yeah. you know, there's a reason you have these powers. There's a reason you're here, Clark. And it's, this is the birth of Superman mindset. This is the birth of that. And I loved how, you know, she, you know, and even she acknowledges, hey, I had this whole speech planned out. I was really going to get into it with you. But I already put my foot in my mouth, didn't I? Because now, now I can't. I can't stop thinking about what would have happened to that family if you hadn't been there. And right there, I was like, yeah. I'm sitting there just thinking, you know, and a great ending with you know, Ma and, you know, him and Ma on top of the house. You got the, the, the farm in that background, the sun just coming up. I was like, oh, this is, gonna, this is cool. It's just a great story. Yeah. And, and I can't wait. Um, I know the next issue just came out. And I can't wait to read it. I didn't have a chance to read it before we recorded, but I can't wait to read this one. Can we jump from this to take a look at the uh, Dark Knight 3, issue number two? Oh, God, yeah. Our next discussion will be of Dark Knight 3, The Master Race, book two. 
This is by story by Frank Miller and Brian Azzarello, pencils by Andy Kubert, inks by Klaus Janssen, colors by Brad Anderson, letters by Clem Robbins, cover by Andy Kubert and Brad Anderson, variant covers Frank Miller and Alex Sinclair, Klaus Janssen and Brad Anderson, Jim Lee, Scott Williams, Alex Sinclair, Cliff Chang, uh, Eduardo Riso, and Trish Mulvihill. Retail variant covers, Sean Gordon Murphy and Matt Hollingsworth, Greg Capolo and FCO Placencia. Co uh, convention variant cover by Jill Thompson. And apologies in advance for any name butchery. Dude, this story has restored my faith in the Dark Knight universe. <laughs> I honestly am loving this. Book one, we talked about as we were going through how... Um, we were loving the story, and I think by the time we were done, we were saying in the beginning that it was a great DC Universe story, trying to get to the point, you know, is it a Batman story, is it not? Oh my gosh, issue number two, just right out of the starting gate, just had me so excited. I love the cover, uh, and I know there's many covers, but, I, you know, the one uh, retail cover with Carrie kind of, you know, locked in up chains, in chains, yeah. yes, and stuff like that. But then we get into the story and really see her being grilled. And her again portraying Bruce Wayne is dead. Bruce Wayne is dead. And this is setting the stage, this storyline for the big event that's coming, which is the Kandorians versus the Justice League. The world. <laughs> or the world, yeah, in general. And I really am loving how this story's playing out. I love the premise of it. The commissioner's portrayal in this is great. These feel like the characters that I really loved in Dark Knight Returns. And it honestly has just kind of made me excited again for the whole universe. I'm excited for the upcoming one shot that's kind of a prequel. It shows Batman's last mission yeah. in this world, you know, with the Joker and all that. Uh, they just really are hitting this with all thrusters. And, and it, it's making me like, wow, I'm, I'm just, I want to go read. You know what I haven't read in a while that I want to go read again? Dark Knight Returns. Uh, I just, I'm like really excited for this Batman, for this world, for these characters. And uh, I really appreciate that this story's gotten me in that place. I mean, are you in the same place? I mean, is this a thing for you? Or for me, it is. These two issues in, it makes me feel like that kid that read the Dark Knight Returns when it first came out again. It, it's here's the thing. I'm really digging the story and I'm like, yeah, you know, but I think you probably have a higher, oh my God factor than I do. Okay. You know, and it's and it's nothing even against the story. This is a great story. This is an epic story, and I'm really digging it, mm -hmm. especially how you talk about how they're really playing it out. It's going to be the Kandorians versus the world. And, you know, the development of of, uh, of uh, Superman and Wonder Woman's daughter, this, the development of Carrie in this, you know, you know and just, you know, the mysteries of what's going on with Superman, what's going on with the world, where is this going to come? I'm really into the, the story, but I think you're a little bit more excited about it than I am. Let, well, let me ask you this, because, I mean, we've talked about this before on the show. Like, um, Dark Knight Returns for you, where does that fall? Like, d does that a story where you kind of look at that and go, that's one of my favorite stories of all time? Or is that one for you that you're kind of like, I enjoyed reading it. I understand the historical significance to it. It was a a, you know, a, a good or great story, but I don't have the connection with it that other people seem to. And there's no, I'm not yeah. loading you with that. No. I, I'm really kind of interested because I'm blown away by this. I'm like, this is awesome. But I'm wondering if there's, for me, it's a nostalgia thing. I think well. it's, I think that's really, I think you hit it, the nail on the, you know, the head on the nail or nail on the head or whatever this, however, however the saying goes, I think you're spot on with that because, you know, I, I look at Dark Knight, yes, it is an iconic story. And it was, you know, historically speaking, as well as story-wise speaking, it was a great story. You know, it was one of those things. But I never had that, oh, my God, type of moment. Now, you know, same thing. This, to me, has that same – I have the same level of appreciation for, you know, Dark Knight 3 that I had for Dark Knight. So, for me, it's on – they're on the same level. So, it's – so once again, this is a great story. This is something that is epic in this universe. And I'm looking forward to the completion of the story. But I'm not, as I said, I'm not on that level you are. Cool. And part of it probably is is nostalgia, you know, because I didn't read Dark Knight when it first came out. Yeah. I read it years later, you know, through, you know, through the podcast. You know, I read it because of, you know, what we do. So it's, you know, I know of its significance and I respect the story that was told, I respect what it actually did for the actual Dark Knight universe, what it did for the Batman universe, you know, and this has that same type of 
epic level of story being told. Plus, I do like the future stories. I do like the older versions where the universe is headed. So this is its own little universe. I'm digging that. I'm enjoying the continuation of it. I want to see the dark. I want to you know read Dark Knight Four. You know I'm. I'm ready. I'm into this universe, but I'm again. I'm not like oh, like you. <laughs> yeah, and I am. And I, you know what? I was wondering if it was a nostalgia piece for it as well, because I remember when I read Dark Knight Returns. I remember when I read it, the joy of riding up to comics and collectibles to pick up the issue. I remember uh, one of the issues in the series, and I forget which one. I got there, and it was sold out. Uh, yeah, and it was uh, one of those things where I had to wait, and I got the reprint, and the reprint came out like almost immediately. So I had read the reprint of that issue. I think it was issue three. I had read the reprint before uh, the issue four came out, so you know I was up to speed and everything on time with it. And, and issue four was a first print. I ended up uh, reading it that way, but I remember just. You know, this this is one of those things where you wrote up to the comic shop. A lot of people were going there. Books would sell out. You know, they yeah. would have a limited amount of them. You know, there was there was that sense of you picked up the book. It was something special. The story was something special. There was cliffhangers at the end. And I remember that, that anticipation of where is this story going? When he put back on the suit for the first time in Dark Knight Returns, that is just such an iconic moment for me. It to tell you how much that story meant to me, when I reread it, I forget that there's bits that happen off panel that aren't actually in the book. Because I've read it so much, yeah. and I've kind of filled in in my own mind you know, what those bits look like in between, that I've crafted segments for the book in my yeah. head that look like really you're intended to do that with, but they're set in stone for me. As the, these happen, I'm like, wait, where is that page? I'm like, it's not there? Because uh, you know, there's a distance between when I reread this, and I often forget that there's certain panels that aren't actually there. They're in my mind. And, <laughs> and I love that about the book. So I was wondering if this one was a portion of it, nostalgia. It's really a great story, though. I, I, I love the intensity of it and what's going on. I love that Carrie has an evolution this is somebody who's been through a lot with Batman. We've seen where the previous stories in this universe have gone for her. So it makes sense that at this point, we would see her being a more seasoned veteran. She's got a skill set to her. She's got a swagger. She's got a backbone to her. And she's fulfilling a mission here. I love her confidence. Uh, you know, the bit where she's being interviewed, and it's clear that that's being set up for a purpose. Her telling the story of what actually happened to Batman and how Batman died, I didn't believe it. I knew it was all bunk, but <laughs> yeah. but it was still, I love that her point is she needed to be convincing in that moment for the commissioner for whatever they're planning. I can't wait to see what they're planning. Yeah, I, I, I want to know what he's doing. What What's the... What's the uh... You know, what does the you know the bat got up his sleeve here? And again, it was funny because when you're reading it, you're going, "Yeah, he's not dead." You know, but you do wonder how much of the story she was telling was true. Did he have that epic battle? Did he have that thing where he was laid out and he was hurting pretty bad? You know, because you go through the story she told about how the boss never got out of bed after that. He couldn't. He was connected by tubes, and you know, without a a needle prick, you know, keeping him alive, you know. You know, you know, he had, you know, and it was like for three years I sat there, I held his hand. He told the stories about being a hero, the finest stuff, you know, and I like you want to know how much of this was true. How much of it did was there actually that epic beatdown? How much of it was that moment? Because you go to that point where the get the page where he dies, you know, where, you know, you know, he's sitting there and he goes his, pretty much his last words were, you know, did I matter? You know, you know, did it, you know, I always thought I'd die alone. You're not alone, boss. You're not alone. And then you get the flat line. Now, in reality, did they get the flat line? Then beep, beep, he come back. Did all did what she tell? Was it actually the truth or was it something she was manufacturing? That's the part I want to see. I want to see how much of it was truth, how much of it was felt was, uh, you know, her story. Yeah, I do, too. I'd like to see the backstory of this one. I think this is one that's worthy of a backstory just because of the nature of it. Uh, what a really terrific uh, storyline that's going on here. The Candor thing is great. I'm just as fascinated by that. I love that we're seeing more of the daughter that was introduced in the previous series, yeah. the second Dark Knight 2, and they're furthering the story of her 
what's going on with Ray makes perfect sense to me, you know, as far as him being the one to go to and to help the Kandorians. Uh, you just so knew where that one's going. <laughs> now, when did you realize they were going to, you know, what was happening here? When they first introduced the concept, I'm like, oh, they're going <laughs> to. So when they went to Ray Palmer, it's like, oh, he's going to bring him. He's going to bring him up to full size. Right. Here's here's why I knew that was going to be the case. Stories like that never go to, and then they went to Disney World together, and, <laughs> and Ray introduced them to what life is like to be a human, and everybody became friends. La 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 la, and it all went along like that. No, no you're going to have a bunch have of a happy ending. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're going to have a bunch of angry Kryptonians. Yeah. Who are going to well, come out and go do do something? I like. Here's the thing, though. I love the way they're handling it. So yeah. I say all that. And where the surprises are, you knew where it was going, but sometimes it is how you get there. It's not about whether it's telegraphed or not. It's the journey. The journey in this is the cool part of it. The dialogue's great. The setup's great. The build is great. Yeah, you know where it was going, but the how you get there is incredibly interesting. Did, now, let me. That's my premise on it. Did you know that's where it was going, or did you think something else? And, and there's no right or wrong to that. Oh no, no, I I, I kind of figured that was going to happen. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it was one of those things where when they introduced the concept for me, the final yes, one hundred percent convinced this is what's going on is when you have that great Ray Palmer scene and he's talking to you know the you know the Kandorian you know and they're going back and forth and you know I love that moment when you know when he's like. Um, um, you know, eventually someday we'll be whole again. And, and Ray goes, God willing. What do you mean by that, Dr. Palmer? Oh, that's a phrase, you know, it means speaking of a power greater than us that we want. Ah, uh, yes, God willing. And the look on his face, I'm like, oh, that's such a super villain look right there. This dude is a crazy man. You know, and I was like, this is awesome. We're going to get some evil, you know, some evil Kryptonians. These Kandorians are going to take over. This right here is the master race. I thought that was going to be that one panel right there was the thing that locked it in place. Now, I do like how. You know, eventually we learn it is kind of a religious type cult type thing. So that really acts accentuates the God willing comment. But, you know, right then and there, you know, oh, this is not going to this. This is. Yeah. Here's what we're up against um, this round. <laughs> you know, it never plays out well in comics or in, ac- in action movies in general. Whistling. Whenever there's <laughs> whistling, something is bound to happen. Like, nobody ever just whistles for the joy of whistling. They're always whistling. Honestly, if I was a guard and somebody started whistling, that's when you hit him in the mouth with something. Yes. <clears throat> you know, you don't let that continue and go on. Um, and I shouldn't say, I'm really not a violent person at all. But I'm definitely in that moment going to go, hey, listen, everybody, she just whistled. I don't know why she's whistling, but who really does that anymore? If you're whistling, you're doing something. Who are you signaling? What are they going to do? You better tell us. And if you're ducking your head down, you're pulling your head up, and you're going to tell us why you're ducking your head down. Because <laughs> I want to know what's going on. Because I've seen too many action movies, and I know that usually when good guys or bad guys whistle, it means bad things for the other people involved. <laughs> whistling never ends well. It's supposed to be a wistful, happy thing never is it in any kind of action sequence at all. It just goes horribly wrong. There was this one um, life lessons I've learned from sci-fi movies or something like that where Uh they talk about how if you ever have a where you think, oh, that's just a noise. No, treat it like a full drill. Have your costumes, you know, your your guards uniforms have to have a clear visor. That way the good guys can't put them on to hide their identity. You know, all these different stuff. Whistling will be added to that list now of things to make sure if someone starts whistling Mm -hmm. or ducking, Mm -hmm. that's an issue. You're right. The ducking's a part two. So it's really in the overall signs of a problem. It's it, the whistling's a problem, and uh, whistling and ducking. You're right; both of those yeah. things become an immediate issue, and you need to let somebody know. I love the Bat Tank. Yeah, the Bat Tank was really cool in Dark Knight Returns. It's really cool here. It was super cool in the Cult. Um, I love the variations of functional Batmobile type vehicles that they do in these stories. It's kind of, uh, you know, reminiscent of things like the Tumblr and stuff too. Like the Tumblr was cool because did you like the Tumblr? Oh God. Yeah. Tumblr's cool. Cause it's functional. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that was, uh, and it was funny because that was his main Batmobile. Yes, yeah. I, I like the fact that his main Batmobile was that you know massively beast of a, a thing, and not you know how we it, more in the comic book we have the more slick look, and then he's got the super armor, he's got the bat tank. No, the Growler was the main vehicle. I, I, again, I, I I really dig Growler. I dig this tank, you know, and once again, really cool action sequences. That was something I growler? remembered from. Did you call it Growler? Yeah. It's a Tumblr. Tumblr, Growler, same thing. <laughs> you say tomato, I say tomato. Exactly. I why think you just Growler call it, wait, sounds better. Why don't you call it Jerry? <laughs> Everybody likes Jerry. You drive around in Steve. Jerry. <laughs> we'll call him Steve. <laughs> call him Steve? Why Steve? Because it's less intimidating. Steve is less intimidating. But don't you want it to be into, like driving around with, like, yeah. watch out, here comes oh. Jerry? I mean, doesn't that sound a little bit more intimidating? Well, then if we're going with that, we got to go with, we'll call him the Dread Pirate Roberts. Because it is the name <laughs> that does it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You say Tumblr, I say Dread Pirate Roberts? Okay. <laughs> All right, sure. Let's move on. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But I was going to... The I am so sorry sequences. I let that continue. Go ahead. The action sequences on this, and I think that was something that was neat from all the previous Dark Knight iterations, especially when we're dealing with the Bat Tank, where you see this massive force just plowing through it. And I really did dig just you know how much you know just raw energy this thing has and how much of a damage it takes, but also just how kind of cool it is. Yeah, it, it just really is cool. And Car- I loved Carrie hiding on the bottom. Yeah. Nobody really quite knowing that she escaped in that moment. And her smile was like, she two steps away from the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that it felt like um, there was the Thomas Crown Affair. Do you ever see that with Pierce Brosnan? Yeah. Yeah. I, I loved, the one thing I really loved about that movie is when the whole plans played out with him, you got to see this whole sequence where, you know, there's people dressed in bowler hats and they're all dressed like Thomas Crown and it's kind of this shell game, big giant human shell game that was going on in that movie. And I really liked that. This, I almost heard that music playing because this was a big giant human shell game (laughs) with tanks, but it was a great way for her to escape. And I just loved how that played out because of the evolution of Carrie. Carrie very much at this point is I'm, I've become my master's greatest apprentice. You know, and it really is a, a sensei master relationship. Batman's her Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, I really love that relationship and how it plays out. This made me geek out. The thing, the thing I love about it is it's dealing with some pretty deep issues with a, a big threat, but at the same time, it's unapologetically a superhero story. I mean, it's really cool how this plays out. You know, it's de- still dealing with political corruption, all that kind of stuff that was in two. But I like that it's not afraid to have a little fun along the way, too, if I'm making any sense. This just feels, I don't know, it's its its making the whole thing from DK1, DK2 to this connect. It's making it all feel better for me. I'm really excited about this storyline and its connection to it. It is geeking me out and making me feel like a kid again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a definitely, again... This is really this has, you know, kind of helped a lot of with some of the stuff that happened in two. You know, it's in a way it's it is kind of weird. You know, you think back to like the Ocean Eleven movies yep. where they had Ocean Eleven's one, two, eh, then three, they're like it was kinda of like three was the apology for two. You know, and they went back and they went back to Vegas and they did things right. For me, you know, with you know, with this issue, you know, you had Dark Knight, you know, the first one. And that great Batman story. Then the second one, they kind of lost their way. And now in this, you know, you know, in uh, book three, yeah, it's still we still haven't really seen Bruce until the very end of it, you know. But they're still they're laying the groundwork for a Batman story. They're laying the groundwork for this really massive enemy enemy that he's going to have to face. Something that you know only Batman's going to be able to deal with. You know, this is a you know an invading force of Kryptonians on this planet to have a little bit of an attitude, a little bit of an edge to him and a lot of crazy going on. So this is going to be Bruce's ultimate challenge that he's going to have to deal with. And so it's taking bits of one and two and really bringing everything home. So I'm, I'm, I am excited for the story that's going to be told. I want to see how Bruce takes them down. I want to see how does Clark get back in the mix? Kara, how does she wonder woman, just the rest of the universe, you know, where are they going to play? How at the end, 
end of three is this unit? What's this universe going to look like? Quar and – now, when did they kill them? Did they kill them in the bottle? Because this the, the death of everybody in Kandor, other yeah. than Quar's followers, had to have been – When they arrived on the platform, he, his followers killed them while they were still small. Okay. That's how I, that's how I'm reading it. That you know he did that right. They they got out, they all walked on the platform and they were all ready. Okay, we got a thousand people here. We're ready. We got more waiting in line. And right as he's about to hit the button, ugh, they all killed him. <laughs> did Ray get smushed? Well, you know, there's a crunch. You know? Yeah, there's a crush. And, yeah, yeah. And part of me wants to hopefully believe that Ray was able to shrink down at the last minute, but you look at how that played out where he's like, I can fix this. No, you can't. You know, the last scene that we see Ray has got his hands up going, no crush. You know? So yeah, I think, I think we lost the atom there. <laughs> I love that you turned that sequence into Mr. Bill. Oh no, Mr. Bill. Oh no, Mr. Palmer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I liked how we got a really cool super villain who, after they arrive, he's going to make sure none of it, only his people are coming back. Heat Vision Blast completely fries the city of Kandor. So, again, you know, that's kind of a holy crud moment there. We got a major crazy dude here. You know, it's going to be a, a interesting run. Now, did Batman know this was coming? I, I, I'm just... I'm floored by what's going on. Carrie's walking up. Bruce has, you know, got the crutch, and he's standing there over the console. Oof. Where is this going? What's what's bringing Bruce out of the woodworks here? I loved. I get. By the way, he's a guy you can do this with. Yeah. Where you just kind of like, okay, it's two issues, and now we're seeing him. Yeah. <laughs> I and, love that. And he's not even. You, you know, he's not nowhere near full powered here. Right. You know, you, again, it's. I'm wondering. What level of interaction is he going to have here? How much of this is going to be? Will they have an ex, you know, uh, a suit for him? Will they have the bat armor once again that he can actually able to do it? Or what's going to happen here? Because you think back to Dark Knight when he went one on one with Superman, that took a toll out of him. You know, now he's even worse off than he was there, and he's going up against an army of Kryptonians. You know, it's you know. Super, uh, Batman being the master planner that he is, being the master of strategy, you know, and everything that is Bruce Wayne, you know, you know he's got a contingency for an army of Kryptonians. You know he's got it out there, but you know what's it going to be? How is he going to lay it out? The Wonder Woman sequence that comes afterwards. I love the way these books are set up. I love that there is the you know the main story going on. Then there's a background story that's giving you some of the history. Wonder Woman has been, between the two issues, a great MVP and the daughter. Yeah. I really think that she makes this book interesting as well with the story. So I, I love the fact that we got the narrative coming from the daughter. She's kind of telling the whole story here. Mom's trying to teach her a lesson on how to fight and how to control herself and really is trying to help her connect with what she believes is her daughter's Amaz Amazonian heritage that the daughter's really Braced her Kryptonian side, and I can't wait to see as this storyline goes on. There's going to be a point where she's going to have to get in the fight, one side or another. And when she does, is she going to be tapping into dad's side or mom's? Yeah, that's. I want to figure that out because you know, with well, one of my theories, the running theory I had before was that she was going to go bad. Yeah. She was going to be the one to turn, and it was going to be her as the. Um, you know, kind of was going to be the force, you know, was going to be the bad guy here. Just the way she kind of had a very major disconnect from the uh, the human race, from everybody, just because of what's going on and who she is. So I'm glad to see the crypto the Kandorians are going to be really the main bad, which adds this whole element. What side is she going to be on? Where is she going to be? She obviously doesn't see herself as an Amazonian. She's a Kryptonian. So when these other Kryptonians arrive, is she going to initially be with them? Is, you know, with uh, Clark, when Clark returns, is that going to draw her over to the humanity side? Or how is this going to play out? She's one of those, I still don't know where her place is going to be in this story, but I'm definitely looking forward to seeing her getting in on the action. 
Yeah, that's that's the part where you're right. The anticipation that you're talking yeah. about there, I think for me, is the home run of this one. I want to see Diana and Diana in the action. I want to see the daughter in the action. I want to see Dad back in the game. Yeah. This this really has all the tenets of what I think is really good in a series like this. It just kind of builds up this whole concept of. You know, I want to see these characters back. I want to see the classic ones back. I want it's it's everything that I'm really liking right now about geek culture, is the balance of something that feels new and fresh, with the right amount of classic and nostalgic. And yep. this is totally geeky nostalgic for me. I do think the distance in time from the original release is helpful as well. You know, like I'm ready to feel very nostalgic about the original story and really enjoy this one's take on it. The I, I don't know how the writing went for this one. If it was you know what parts are Miller, what parts are Azarello, how they handled their collaborative piece. But it what I will say is this is really a good collaboration and kudos to everybody involved, art and writing, for really making this feel like uh, something special. <laughs> is this is see that's the funny part with I'm feeling like this is a very special story because of the nostalgia piece. How are you feeling outside of that? Because you don't have that take on it. This is a, just is just a story you're encountering from the first and second book now. So where does this fall for you right now? Like in your reading enjoyment, reading excitement right now, where are you at with this book comparatively? I'm dude. I'm I'm excited for it. I'm big time into it. It just you know, again, it's you know, um, you know, it's. You know, it's I don't know I it's a t- that's a tough call I reading and enjoyment excitement I you know when the uh, the Dark Knight books come out I do jump to it right away you know when this one for when I when this one came out I picked it up I read it you know this was a you know, right away reading I already had it read when we started talking about doing it because you know I'm keeping up on the the story I'm not letting anything slip you know not letting anything slide or you know build up so that's you know a definite statement just because and there is a lot as I said a lot of anticipation as to where this is going to go I'm really curious to see how Clark gets back in the mix I'm curious to see where the daughter plays out you know, so there is excitement, you know, anticipation, all that, you know, and I am even thinking off page where things could go, what they could do. You know, I want to know what's going to happen to the baby that keeps that everywhere Wonder Woman's going. Yes. She's got the kid strapped yeah. to the back. Is is the kid going to play a, some type of factor in this story? You know, or is he going to be, you know, the, the papoose the whole time? It's there's a lot of stuff. I'm like, what about this? What about that? What about that? You know? <laughs> And those are all questions I want to have answered along the way. I'm, I'm really <laughs> excited to see them play off and be answered. You, you know, something I really did like about this Wonder Woman story, mm-hmm. the daughter never once touches the ground. The entire time, she's flying. Oh, yeah. And even with the Ray Palmer stuff, she's always flying. She's always just a couple feet off the ground. She's never on the ground. And I like the fact that she does that because, once again, it's her saying, hey, I'm a Kryptonian. I don't need to stand on the ground. I fly everywhere. Yeah, you know, I, I like that. I like how just that you know, it was again. It's part of this. Their her mindset. Can we talk about Lucifer real quick? Oh yeah. Our next discussion will be Lucifer number one. The writer is Holly Black with artist Lee Garbett, colorist Antonio Fabella, with letterers Todd Klein, cover artist Dave Johnson, assistant editor Molly Mahan, editor Ellie Price with executive editor, executive editor Shelley Bond, and based on the characters created by Neil Gaiman, Sam Keith, and Mike Regenberger. One of the great things about uh, Lucifer and this story is it spins out of uh, the concepts introduced in Sandman. And Sandman is one of those stories that, if you haven't read it, if you're newer to Vertigo, I can't recommend enough going back and reading Sandman because it just really is. It's been recollected so many times in different hardcover version, absolute versions. They have an annotated uh, version out there for people that are really want to get into kind of the behind the scenes stuff or the hidden meanings of of a lot of the things that are, are going on in the story. But it led to lucifer having his own series and then with this relaunch of vertigo which is really what's going on right now it's a revival of vertigo it's really fitting that you get a book that comes from that sandman concept and put out there this first issue was really cool 
I enjoyed this because it, it had a to me there's a connection to Sandman, but it's not a th- it's not a thing in the sense that you don't need to have read anything in order to understand this. They give you the first issue right out of the gate. Lucifer's back. And people aren't happy about it. <laughs> you know, um, hell's moved on uh, since he's been gone. And because of that, Lucifer is not necessarily wanted. Lucifer trying to come back and make an appearance is, you know, something that would be worrisome, which you would think would happen with people of this caliber. I loved every bit of this because of that. It felt like natural. It totally was cool to see L- Lucifer being hunted down. Because of what's happened in there. It's really interesting to be in a book where you're rooting for Lucifer. Because I was rooting for <laughs> Lucifer in this. And you're a fan of, of Buffy and Angel and stuff like that. And I think this is a little bit closer to that kind of of, of book or that type, kind of storytelling that was going on in that. So I was, And I don't know if you think I'm right on that. For me, I get that kind of fix from this. But that's me. Where were you at on this book? Did you like uh, – well, here's the thing – I asked you if we could do this one and told you I was really excited to talk about it. I told you not to tell me how you felt about it because I was really curious to have that without you feeding me that. So where are you at on this one? I'm, I'm very curious. I, I was going to, you know, kind of run a little a bit, and, you know, on you and say how much I hated it and how it's blasphemy and it's evil <laughs> and stuff like that. I was going to do that, but I'm like, you know, I've done that so many times that one, I don't think anybody listening would even remotely buy that. Um, I got to tell you, one of the things that I really got to give full kudos to is the creative team and how they crafted this story because. All this stuff that happened in Sandman, all this stuff that happened before, I never read. Right. This is my introduction to this. And now once did I feel lost. Now once did I feel, what the heck? And even they had a couple well-placed editor notes in there where I'm like, had me thinking, maybe I should go pull out, find that Constantine issue and read that and see what happened here. Or read that, you know, episodes of uh, Sandman. You know, see where that came from. They pulled from a lot of different stuff, completely laid out what I needed, and I still had that same sense of continuation of the story that I didn't know the story before, but I felt like, yeah, this is really flowing from that last stuff just because they laid it out so comfortably for me. So, you know, creatively wise, this was an absolute wonderful story. Story wise, this is a really cool story. I'm in, very interested in it. I'm always cautious and curious and leery when they start when stories start going into you know religion base you know i'm always you know it's you know when you start talking about you know god and you know lucifer and angels and you know whatnot when you start throwing in people's actual direct faith you know and beliefs there's always a i'm always kind of leery of it because you know i I don't want, you know, I, I respect you know, creators' abilities to tell a story, but I don't want someone to be disrespectful to my faith or to my beliefs. And throughout this, I didn't get that vibe from this. I didn't get that. I never felt reading this. I never felt like they were, you know, just, you know, dismissing, you know, you know, my beliefs or dismissing, you know, my faith. And I thought, I think I always like when you get stories that have where you can truly see, yes, this is just a story. This isn't an insult. This isn't a slap in the face. And so that's something, again, I'm like, okay, after the first issue, I'm like, all right, we can keep going. Let's see where this goes. And, and they definitely, as I said, they laid some great groundwork for these characters that I want to see where they're going. I'm still not going to say I'm rooting for Lucifer just because he is the fallen angel. I'm not going to root for him. I'm going to root for the good guys, but oh, it is wait, one of those wait, things where i what happens to him. Wait, you said you're going to root for the good guys. Who are the good guys? In this? I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. I I, I think it may be the junkies. <laughs> I think the junkies may be the good guys. Are you seeing this. some hope in, for them in the future? Is that what you're, is that what yeah, you're counting I'm thinking, on? Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. maybe that's going to be the redemption. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After seeing Lucifer, they're kind of like, you know, hey, uh, they straighten their life out and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's. I, I want to actually touch on something you talked about that really isn't in the story. Just before we jump into more of the story, because you, you touched on an interesting point. You talked about you know this story having a religious connotation, and obviously, you know, we're both Catholic, so it's the same belief system that we're coming from. And I think people have different amounts of latitude as far as what they'll let a story do, uh, where it's not really about their faith. Like for me, I have a lot of latitude. I can. 
I can separate from a story, and, and this is no way meant to be condescending or anything like that. I really believe th- how you feel about this is very personal, and I really respect it, but I'm just sharing mine. I can separate a story from my faith and recognize this is just a writer's interpretation or a writer's story that they're trying to tell. It is. It does not affect my belief in any way, shape, or form, or my enjoyment. Now, for some people, I, I think their latitude is very tiny, where it's like, I'm not going to even read this because it's about Lucifer, and I understand that it's got nothing to do with, really, with my religion, but I don't care. I don't want to read a story about Lucifer or anything like that. This, because... And and honestly, this can be another issue where like Sandman was kind of my gateway, but Preacher, Preacher played around with a whole bunch of stuff and was incredibly irreverent. And I adored Preacher. Uh, This is a book that obviously plays around with all of those. I would argue that in this story, Lucifer is at least the anti-hero is such an overused word and such an overgeneralized word. Um, I I guess is the hero of this story just because it doesn't look like it's going to be Lady Lucifer. It's funny. I'm almost leaning towards saying maybe you're right he's not the hero um i still find myself rooting for him but i you're kind of right he's not the hero of this story so i don't know where to go with that one what is your latitude though because mine i'm gonna i'll admit openly mine's pretty it takes a lot to offend me on it and even i could even read a book written by somebody who blatantly is against my religious beliefs it's just not going to change anything um if the book's well written if it's a bunch of nonsense, I don't want any part of it. Right. But like, this is a well-written story, so I can appreciate this as being this book's own lore. So that gives it a lot of latitude for me. Where were you at? I think for me, a lot of times it's which, you know, what part of the religion is actually being used. Like, I read oh. one story one time where uh, they had uh, Jesus in it. And they were very, Jesus was not paid in a very was very negative, you know, on how he was portrayed in the book. And I couldn't get through the first issue just because I'm like, dude, that's Jesus. You, you know, that's mm, that right there. That was my that. line. I could, I'm like, I stopped reading right then and there because I was like, you know, I couldn't do it, but I read preacher and I like preacher. I like how preacher really just, you know, again, not the most complimentary towards the kingdom of heaven, but it still had kind of a, it, it was a really well crafted story and how they portrayed it and how they you know started revealing one piece of the puzzle after another. Now it's funny that you say that because when you're talking about it's a story that kind of portrays Jesus that way, I'm kind of like, well, I don't know how far off I am from that. I have to read the actual story you're talking about or start reading the actual story you're talking about before I could actually really judge how I'd feel about it. But I, I will say when you were saying, I'm like, oh, I think I really am a little more uncomfortable with that too. So I can see his point yet. It's funny how I have, I seem to have a, a much more vast latitude for God than I do, <laughs> you know what I mean? Which seems to be strange. It should, it seems like that should be on the equal level. Right. Um, I, maybe because Jesus was like the personification, you know, in, in our religion yeah. and that type of thing. It's funny that you mentioned that. Wow. I, I guess I, I never really thought about it that way. I thought I had like this really vast latitude and I think I still do. But when you were describing what you were, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know that I'm that comfortable with that either. I'd have to read yeah. it. Like, I am. It's funny. I'm, I mean, curious to read it. I would, uh, if, you, if you end up remembering at some point what that was that you read, I'm actually curious to try and read it to see. <laughs> well, hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you, I mean, I, I, we don't spend a lot of time on it now. I'd just be curious if you actually remember what it was. I actually would be curious to read it and see how I feel about it. It's more of an off the air kind of thing. But, um, so we're in this story, and we see Lucifer kind of hanging out and, and doing his own thing in the in the sports car, which was really kind of cool. Uh, then we get this whole sequence of events uh, where we, they kind of give you the nice little heads up on where everything's been. And then we see Lucifer, you know, fall to earth, and he's stabbed, and he's hurt. And trying to figure out what, like, precipitated this and what happened to him, you know, is that the fall? Is that supposed to be the fall again or something else? I don't know. Yeah, it's, well, you know... Um... I'm trying to figure out, did that occur in the previous stuff? Was that something that carried over, or is that still a new mystery? I never read all of Lucifer. Okay. Um, just I didn't have the budget at the time to read all of Lucifer. So I read certain trades of it. 
I haven't read everything, so I don't know f- about that. I've never read this particular okay. sequence again, so this could be a wink and a nod to his original fall from grace. But my question would be, why is he still bleeding? Well, and they, they when uh, Gabriel eventually catches up to him, there is something kind of festering in there. There's right. something that happened to him. And it's kind of neat because when you see like those opening sequences, you know, when they show, you know, the devil is back. He might not you know, be like to admit it, but we all missed him. You look at that sequence when he's standing there in his, you know, his, you know, whatever, his bar and whatnot. You can see he's bleeding from the side. So this devil here has already been stabbed because they've got that that blood right there in the side there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, so this is one of those kind of I like how it was one of those things where they show and this was the flashback to when he first landed. Yeah, you know, what we saw initially at the beginning of the book was you know present day. This is the flashback of him landing, and then this is you know then you go into the you know with uh, Gabriel being recruited to bring you know to go back to the service. You know, I, I I liked how just all again this is a really cool boom 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 boom. You know, with you know, and again Gabriel's a story. I know that happened. I'm assuming in the previous you know stuff, that's a story I do want to see. I want to see the fall of Gabriel and what happened and who cut out the serpent took your heart. I want to see that story, how that happened. What ha- what was Gabriel's fall? How did that play out? Yeah, I, this part is something that I'm really digging about this whole story. This sets up for me a chance. I didn't get a chance to read all. I read all of Sandman. I read some of the books that were spinoff. Um, I just didn't have the budget for it. I really like that this, for me, feels like it's... I'm in at the ground floor. Like, they're given... Yeah. You mentioned that you're being, being given everything you need. I'm being given everything I need here, too. And I'm really anxious to follow this story. It pulled me in right away. And I like a story that doesn't make you feel like, wow, okay, I'm... I like it feeling like there's a continuity and there's a, a attachment to what has come previously. But I also like that I don't have to feel like... And I even like that with books where I've read all of it. Like, I like the connection pieces. I like that they put them in. I like the editor's notes that you're mentioning. I think they're really important and critical because they do reference you back to either stories you've read previously or encourage you to read those stories to seek them out to see the backstory, which I think is cool. But I like that this book didn't make you feel bogged down with a whole bunch of lore that, like, you felt like you had to memorize like you were in a class. Um, It was great that it kind of just spoon-fed you things along the way, the way a good story should I felt there's a lot of depth to this and a lot of really great information that was given in a story that had me very interested in the players. I think what's far more interesting on this one, and I think it separates it from, like, my favorite book right now is Secret Six. I just, I love and adore that book. What I like about this one is these characters really feel bad. (laughs) I I mean, like, these are, like, I rally behind the Secret Six, even though I shouldn't and I feel dirty about it. I can't, like, if I rally behind these guys, I am not going to have any illusions that I'm rallying behind really bad beings here. Lucifer's not a good guy. Lucifer's a bad guy. But on the other hand, he seems to be a better guy than, which is funny that, you know, he's. Well, the lesser of two evils. Sure. Yeah. But that's the thing. You know, that's, he's the prince of lies. And I like the fact that, you know, you're right now we're saying, well, he's the lesser of two evils. Is he really? You can't really be too certain. And I think that for me is one of the cool craftings yeah, of who how knows? he is being written in this where he's coming. He's got this persona that he looks like he may not be such a bad guy. But again, Prince of Lies. You know, you can't completely trust them. And it's, it was a really cool moments that, you know, you have that, there's always going to be that doubt. What is, you know, who is the true bad? I like how at the beginning of us where I'm like, I want to root for the good guys. And you're like, who is that? And we still really don't know. I want to know who are going to be the good guys in the story. Because you got Gabriel who's, a, who's you know, a fallen angel, but he's not really, he's not fallen. I, I want to read that it because, um, they when he and when Gabriel and Lucifer have their battle in the bar, he makes reference to a Hellblazer issue, I think sixty six, where I wanna read that story. I wanna see what happened to Gabriel, how he got his heart cut out. Because obviously when that happened, he then became mortal. And or this version of mortal, I don't know if he truly is mortal or whatnot, but you know, and then but now the archangels are recruiting him for this mission because 
father, the presence, God, whatever you're going to call him. Is he dead? I don't know. They're like, is he dead? It seems so. He does not stir. So there's still a presence there. It's just not active. So maybe there's something else that can bring the presence back. I don't know. These are all little mysteries that they're laying out. And again, looking at the different archangels, are these really good guys? Or are they just intense? Or what's their story? There's so many different things where you're going. I'm asking myself, who is the good guy? Who do you root for? And I like that I have this great mystery about it. Yeah, yeah, I do too. That great mystery is something that I think is pretty critical and important to me. That's what's keeping me going. You know, is... Is God dead? Is God alive? I part part of me is thinking that Metatron is somehow responsible, and I, I don't know that I'm right or wrong on that one. I don't really care. Uh, but when that sword came blazing out, and, and this it was kind of like too much attention being devoured to Lucifer's the one behind this. He, yeah, the timing was exquisite that he was there. Oh well, yeah, the timing's exquisite, especially if you're trying to cover your track it's, tracks over there, Metatron. So I don't know that stuff really had me captivated, and, and I enjoyed that. Yeah, they really did lay down the groundwork of because you know if you, the basic knowledge you think oh the archangels they got to be good guys you know and a lot of times in really cool stories the archangels aren't portrayed as the best of people you know and it's kind of I but it's the whole very intense towards their mission towards what they have to do it's they're they're not the the creatures of compassion they are the warriors of god they are the ones who smite the demons they are the ones who lay down with the flaming swords you know, and vanquish you know what is you know vanquish it's you know i like how they have have that intensity to him because that same thing you had with Metron, I kind of had that same type of vibe going towards him. I had that initial feeling. And again, whenever you you see somebody try to rush somebody into, you know, push somebody into a way that makes you question. They really push Gabriel, go slay uh, Lucifer. And what's Lucifer, the first thing he does, he goes, hey, he's my father, too. I want to help find who took him out as well. So I like, again, the Prince of Lies. Is he telling a lie? Is he not? What's the case here? It's, it always, for me, it keeps going back to the, what's their intention? What's the real play here? And I think that, for me, that's what's pulled me into the story. Yeah, I find that part captivating. And and I want to, you know what I love? They, they set up that neat little battle where, and then, like, the possibility that Gabriel and Lucifer are going to work together. But this whole thing with Lady Lucifer, or Lady Mazakeen, who I guess is Lady Lucifer now? Yeah, I I can't wait to see where that's going, because now that he's back and and possibly teaming up with Gabriel, she's not going to want him back. That's a threat to where she currently is at and what she's currently doing apparently, because it looks like she's taking his spot. Yeah, yeah, it looks like she's the the head of all head down there. So she's not going to share the spotlight. She's not going to want you know give up the throne. You know, so it's you know <laughs> that's cool though. I like that stuff. Yeah. So, like, in the scale of, of things with books that you're keeping and not and not sure and anything like that, where did this one fall? I mean, is this one, like, you need a couple more issues before you've made a decision on where you're going with it? Or is this one you're, like, immediately excited about? Where do you fall on this type of book? Oh, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the pull list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, there, there was way, I had way too many questions at the end of the book to, to say, ah, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it's in solid. And this is an ongoing, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, this was one of those ones where like, oh, okay, I'm glad this is an ongoing. We'll see, you know, again, you know, I'll assess, you know, everything later on. But, you know, this is this is a solid yes, I'm into it. Because, I'm, I, as I said, I've got so many questions. I want to know who is the good guy? Who's the bad guy? What's going on here? Where's, what's up with the presence? You know, and just too many mysteries, you know, too many questions. I, I, you know, right now, it's, you know, I'm locked in on this. What we're trying to do is gradually kind of go through all the Vertigo titles that have come out in this new launch and at least spotlight them you know, in, in segments like this where we, we talk about them. What I think is going to be interesting, Jim, is going to be what books we want to come back to. You know what I mean? Because we, oh, yeah. we have a normal rotation here, and now Vertigo, obviously, by the fact that this line is relaunched and we've, we've both started reading them, they're fair game for us to kind of throw out, hey, dude, are you reading this or not? And I do think there's, it would be interesting whether we're reading it or not to have that discussion as far as uh, I, I want to, you know, kind of do a little quick blurb on this book and why I'm still digging it. And also it'd be interesting to say, nah, you know, I had to drop that one. I, I just, I lost interest or something like that. It'd be interesting to kind of talk about where these go for me right now. Oh my gosh, there's a launch. 
I was kind of hoping there'd be some of them. <laughs> I was like, uh, I don't know, I want to keep that one or something like that. Uh, my problem is that so far, everything I'm reading out of the new Vertigo launch, I'm loving. I mean, what talent they put behind these books. This is a really, if you want to put a template out as far as how to do a successful launch of a line, this is the way to do it. I mean, because at least from a reader's standpoint, this is exactly what I want from a launch. <laughs> I just want a lot of great titles that I'm like, oh, these all feel different. And they're all delivering the kind of storytelling that I want. And that's in a good and bad way. That's how I feel yeah. about this launch because there's been way too many great books off of this one. Yeah, I, I think I said this last episode and I'll keep saying it time and time again. Just when I think I'm out, <laughs> they pull me back in. Oh, this Vertigo relaunch. You know what? They really had me, and I'm all in on this. It's So far, all these issues, all these titles have been really good. And I'm like, yeah, I want to keep reading that. And some of them were, you know, I'm going through my ordering, and I'm like, oh, no, it's done. Oh, it's just a four-part. Dang it. <laughs> you know? Does Now, is it, is what's interesting for you, and I'm actually finding this, I had a stretch there where I was reading Vertigo Strictly in Trade. Yeah. And I was liking that for a while. I was my problem is what I've found now is I don't know. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. It seems like I should still have the time for that. I don't seem to have a lot of time to read full trades. Jumping in on the ground floor of books like this for me feels right now where it's like, I know I want to read this monthly. Like I'm in, I'm into the whole idea of like staying caught up with this monthly and getting that serialized storytelling. I'm not looking into these and going, oh, I'm going to stockpile that one and read it in trade or something like that. I'm like, no, I just want to continue going on in the journey with this book and, and kind of going on that end. So that has me a lot more excited about these titles than the idea of, oh, I heard good things about this. Let me start reading it. I read the first trade. I've got like 10 more trades to read. Let me kind of go make my way through that. This is a lot more welcoming to me right now. Just kind of where I'm at time-wise right now. I think with my time, it's nice to be on the ground floor of these, to be able to read these books and continue on the journey with them as they kick and kick off and start. That's where I'm at. How does that work for you? Are, are there any of these you're kind of looking at now, save them for trade? Or or is it better that you're starting off at the ground floor and just kind of going along as, you know, as what the book I'm comes doing, out? What my plan is probably eventually going to shift to uh, digital. Instead of shifting to trade, okay, you know, I think because because what I found when I was buying trades, I was stockpiling. I've got still yes. this massive pile of trades that I have to read. I've got a massive pile of others. I'm like, ah, but if I can, sh you know, instead of you know keeping getting the regular monthly, I may shift it to a digital format for uh, the Vertigo t for the ongoing Vertigo titles. I don't know when I'm going to do it yet. But, you know, I may pick like, you know, issue t after issue 10, I'll have the first 10 in paper and then starting 11, I'll just go with the digital format. And so why here? I'm curious about this. Why the decision for digital for those? And that's not a, that's not a knock. I actually find it fascinating. What why this line digital or, or certain books in this line digital versus just continuing them paper? Well, I think it's, you know, because I, when I get something digital, I, I can order it and I have less of a – it seems like I have less of a pressure to get to mm. it and read it. I can read it at my leisure. You know, and like when I'm talking about getting digital stock, but I may wait you know, until like three or four issues are digital, go buy them all at once, sit and read it. Oh, okay. Whereas you know, instead of buying and having a stock, stack of uh, paper issues out there. So an impulse read and just kind of like enjoy that experience – and and not have to worry about when it's released and things like that. Exactly. Kind of kick back, relax, enjoy it, but also not have to worry about storing it afterwards. Exactly. That's I think one of the big things with me. I'm looking at, you know, I've got I've got a lot of room, you know, in my you know my comic vault, but I do have to, you know, be leery. It's not a it's not a black hole of in, you know unlimited space. I do have to start you know making sure, and I'm I'm looking at how I'm organizing stuff, and I've got. <laughs> the way my house is laid out, I've got my computer room where I do my recording, and I've got a bunch of books here. You know, I've got a bunch of the drawer boxes here, and part of the reason I have the drawer boxes here is because it helps deaden the sound so I don't have a massive. When I first moved into the house, I had this massive, massive echo. Well, I put stuff in there. Well, I have my other comic room. Where I have a room where it's just have the comic books. It used to be my it used to be a guest bedroom that I took the bed out and I've just got drawer boxes and I've got tables lined up. You know, so I've got these 
these piles of comics, you know, and that's how I have like my active reads are on these tables, not actually in a, um, you know, in a drawer box when I'm done with the active reads, then I move them to the drawer boxes and it's, you know, I'm still building my system. But I also have another room <laughs> that is my guest bedroom that I actually have some comic books laid out that are to books to be read so i am in three rooms of my house with comics so i do have to start really getting my system together and i'm looking at my one room i'm thinking about turning it into a giant library so i'm really gonna be in like four rooms with comics it's my house is a man cave because it's just me so i can do whatever i want with it so my whole house is dedicated to the reading and enjoyment of comics that's awesome <laughs> Yeah, that part is... Uh, so do you find that you enjoy that, or do you find that like you have a certain amount of pressure to organize it a certain way, or no. things like that? Because that's one of the things that I always felt like, I love my collection, but like I don't want people walking into... I know you don't have it this way, so don't... I'm not loading it this way. I don't want people walk, walking to my house and, and like the collection is the thing that's there. It's... Uh, I, I want that to be kind of my own private thing. Like the man cave example that you give them, like I get that. That's like kind of my vibe as well. The idea that the door box is dead at a certain amount of echo sound and stuff like that's a nice little bonus. You've got them in your man cave room and stuff like that. Um, my storage is very much the same way and I, I'm actually starting to run out in my basement of storage. Yeah. Um, re, uh, running out of what's a reasonable amount of storage that would make it fit down there. So... Um, you know, I'm kind of in a, a phase where I'm like, ooh, let me figure out how I, I want to handle that. You know, do I sell off certain elements of the collection? Uh, do I just find another place to put them? I don't know what I'm going to do on that end. That's that's kind of a very much a thing <laughs> for me. So it's interesting when you talk about that to kind of think about that part. It's, and it's frustrating because I love the books and, and I've got to be very careful on, on any move I decide to make. When I was first... Yeah, because I'm still really not cut happy with my organization. It still is in a state of disarray, but it's a lot better than what it was. And when I was really initially starting to organize it you know, and get things laid out, I, you know, I have um, I've got this, I've got a living room that I completely covered the floor of the living room with piles of books and stacks and like, okay, this is here, this is there. And I was just trying to get everything organized. I had, you know, the, my one, I had the bedroom, the guest room, the computer. I had all these different rooms had different piles and I'm slowly moving them. Eventually I'll just have really just the two rooms that'll have the comic books in them. But it's, you know, there is a, there is a level of disarray that does annoy me. And like when, you know, you know, um, a lot of times my folks, my folks live on the east side. I live on the west side. So when they're over, especially late at night, they crash here. You know, and the one guest bedroom we call dad's room because that's the room he sleeps in because he like, you know, that's his room. And it's, you know, so whenever dad's here, I got to make sure I have all the comics off of dad's bed because, you know, he's going to have to, he's going to, you know, he's going to have to set up to, you know, for sleeping, you know. And so I got to make sure the books aren't, you know, in the living room anymore. Okay, let's get those back up here. So there is is a level of disarray that you know when i have people over that i'm like ah quick sh sh shuffle around so i am trying to still get the plate get the, my house to a level of comfort level i'm not there yet that's got to be the hard part too is yeah. um well like, in my head i've got the master plan you know and it's the implementing the master plan is the problem like right now i've got yeah but you still think that master plan involves strategy so like you're, you're, it <laughs> automatically that's falls problem. apart that's why it's yeah. not happening <laughs> yeah. i'm using strategy i need to use strategy <laughs> oh there we go it's clear now i know exactly what i have to do <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> starting to snort here <laughs> yeah. That's that's the funny part about collections. It's it's always, um, you know, there's there's such a personal thing. The collections that you have, I've I've had to purge collection portions of collections before, and I've almost always regretted it. Because <laughs> you know what ends up happening is the second you purge it, you read something that makes you want to read what you purged, <laughs> and you're kind of like, no, I want that back. What did I do? <laughs> the way I'm looking at right now, what I have laid out. Room wise, in the master, in my master plan I have in my head, I've got easily, I think, another five years. Mm -hmm. 
you know, but at that five year mark, I'm going to have an issue. <laughs> I'm going to have a storage issue. I you're gonna, you know what you're going to have to do, Jim? You're going to have to reboot. <laughs> <laughs> If it wasn't for those pesky beds, yeah, you know, if you'd people just sleep on the floor, you could use all the bedrooms. Okay, hold on now. Here's the thing. <laughs> there was a period where I was thinking, <laughs> you know, what I could do is I could lay the drawer boxes down, uh huh, and you know, on a couple rows of drawer boxes, and then put a mattress on top of that. Oh, that's now there's an idea. Yeah, I actually when um you know before I moved into my current house mm-hmm. and I was living at my folks' house, I actually was eyeballing that, thinking, you know, you know what you you know what else you could work. do. You know, what you, you know what you could do then each year as you have more need, you just put another row of drawer boxes under that mattress and keep letting it raise up. <laughs> yeah, I'll do the you know the princess and the pea, huh? Yeah, well, it'll be like a by the time you get done, it'll be like a bunk bed. You got to use yeah. a ladder to get up on it and stuff like that. It'll be great. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so how serious did you get about that? Like, did you actually look into the possibility of it making yes, it work? Did I, you? I, serious, I was looking at it, you know. And Would there be a box strings or just a mattress? Cause they're, no, they're, no, it was going to be just, it was going to be the drawer boxes uh-huh. and then the mattress on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to sleep in the comic bed? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was going to be my bed. <laughs> oh, really? That was what you're going to do? <laughs> That's what I was going to sleep in, you know. But then when I moved here, I had more room and all that stuff because... I'd see you the know. neighbors now. When did Segalin's house turn into an 18 story building? That's just, he's a comic <laughs> fan. It's like he's been keep going. <laughs> uh, yeah, hey, yeah. There's uh I'm looking, you know, I'm as I said, I've got this master plan in my head. I think mm-hmm. uh I got five more years of where I'm I'll be comfortable. After that five year mark, I'm gonna be borderline ordering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have like a little walkways made. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Guys in our stuff. <laughs> he is called Hawkman. His gauntlets possess awesome powers. Hey guys, Jonathan Sokolowski here. Jonathan Track Sokol on the Facebook group. Um, I'm calling in honor of Brett Booth in issue 47 of The Flash. Uh, Sadly, it's his last, and he will be missed. Um, Brett Booth seems to be a comic book artist that is the internet either loves or hates, and I absolutely love his art. I firmly believe that he is one of the all-time great Flash artists. Um, and I don't care what naysayers have to say about that. The proof is in, in the pages. Just look at the way he draws the flash in motion, which is the most important part of an artist drawing the flash. Without that, it, it's going to be hard to, to hook people, I think. And the way that he's able to capture the flash in motion is no one else have ever has, to me, captured it the way that he has. And it's brilliant, and he will be missed. Um, I believe Jesus Marino is coming on next. I think he's the guy who launched the New 52 Superman book with George Perez. Uh, I could be mistaken, but if I'm not, I know he'll do a good job. He's he's a fantastic artist, but I will miss Brett Booth. The, the man deserves all the accolades, uh, so he will be missed. Um, I just wanted to uh, see what you guys thought about that, if you agree or not, but I will miss Brett Booth. Take care, guys. Bye. Yeah, it's actually, it's funny when he's talking about Brett Booth leaving. I really enjoyed Brett Booth since Backlash. I was a big fan of the Backlash series from Image. He, having him in DC and doing the work on like Teen Titans and this has been really great. I've loved the Flash work. Flash is one of my favorite books. I, I've been a Flash fan consistently since Wade's run. And one of the things, it's funny, as John was talking about uh, his love for what Brett Booth was bringing. I think it's one of the things that I think The Flash has enjoyed. Great art. I think there's been really great artists that have touched the character. I think there have been a diverse array of artists that have touched The Flash. So I think, you know, his point, he was talking about how sometimes uh, the art can be polarizing or something like that. I, I, I don't know. I guess I can see that because art's very subjective. But for me... I really enjoy that The Flash has had just really terrific artists do their take and interpretation. The sense of speed he's right in this book, I think, has been really stellar. I think it has felt unique. And I think that's true of really great artists. They kind of develop, how do I 
want this to all play out and what do I want it to look like and how am I going to make it consistent so people feel like they're reading a flashbook, but they also feel like I've made my stamp on this. And I think Brett Booth did that. I mean, oh, it was really, time. really high quality artwork on this. Where, I mean, where are you at? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm echoing you. I'm echoing, you know, every. It's, yeah, it's. I really digged his artwork on it, and I'm sad to see him go because uh-huh. I know when we talked about, you know, the Flash, that was one of the things I did like how he had the fluidity, how he had that motion and the flow, because you need to have that with a Flash book, you know. And I've read and heard and talked to creative you know artists who've been on the the flash book and they always talk about how that's one of the big pieces on flash you know with with batman you can get away you know like you know batman you you want to have some motion because he is fighting grayson you definitely want to have that motion because he with his fighting style but with the flash you really need to be able to portray that you really need to have that that's the show the speed on that piece of paper and the, you know this this team has been one of those really solid ones so it's yeah i'm i'm sad to see him go i definitely had no negative feelings towards uh, the look of the book at all or even the story being told either yeah i i dig the flash this has been a the flash has been a solid read for me and you know if it is uh jesus taking over he's another artist that i think is a really good one so me too. you know so i'm gonna see yeah let's see how he i'm, I'm trying to remember if he's if he's really done the flash before and it's not ringing in my head but he's got an art style i think that would work well for the flash as well so let's see where that goes too yeah he said these i guess it looks like he's doing a five issue mini that mm-hmm. will be announced in the march solicits so i can't wait to see that but i hope we get him back on a monthly of some sort yeah, oh, definitely want him on a monthly. Definitely, I don't want him to leave. I don't want him to go over to Marvel or anywhere else. Let's keep him in the family. Let's keep him on a book, you know, that I'm reading regularly. Yeah, 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 exactly. I, I'm really, uh, it's just, it's an art that I dig. Yeah. That's always my big worry. I don't mind when artists shift to, like, new projects and things like that, because I'm always interested to see, okay, what are they going to do now, because I'm already a fan. But... You know, like you mentioned, Jesus Marino. I like that art. So, I mean, cool. And I, I wouldn't mind seeing that take. I think that'd be kind of neat. As long as I get to see Brett Booth on something that I like. You know what I mean? So, I'm hoping that happens. I, I don't know what that looks like. I'm cool. I, I'm interested to see what this mini is. Um, but I, I, I want to see even more of, of this artist. Because I think it's a, a great artist. I don't pay attention to a lot of, you know, kind of the internet chatter when people don't like something that I like. <laughs> Because it makes me, I, uh, it makes me crabby. Like I, here's the thing: I like Brett Booth on Flash, so I don't want to read a whole bunch of comments from people that don't. And it's, I mean, I can respect if it's not your cup of tea, cool. And if you want to talk about it with others who feel similarly, go ahead. <laughs> I just don't want to read it. <laughs> there's, there's way too much negativity. Let's yeah. just, you know, it, it's one of those things that really does <laughs> anger and annoy me. Sure. You know, and it's not even just in comic books, it's in life. People just, they want to complain and they want to be like, you know what? Just relax. What the heck is wrong with you? It just, sometimes, you know, do you realize you're complaining? Wait, 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 hold on. You need a hug. (laughs) Do you realize you're complaining about complaining? (laughs) I am complaining about complaining. I hate hate. I really hate it when people don't. Like it. Yeah. <laughs> Dang it, man! What the heck? I hate when people. You know, you know what? You know what this conversation needs? What? A chat thread afterwards, <laughs> <laughs> so we can all complain with you about complaining. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to protest. We're not going to protest. <laughs> <laughs> I protest you not protesting. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree that it's sad that he's leaving the book just because I've really enjoyed the artwork and it's been a great run. Let's check in with our next voicemail. Hi, this is Jack Dower from Redlands, and I wanted to say, first off, that I believe the uh, Penguin and Riddler from Gotham would be the perfect duet for next year's like DC Christmas album or something. I just loved hearing those two singing the song, the, the song that Penguin's mother used to sing to him. That Penguin Riddler team up is the first thing I want to raise about. They are awesome. And the ending of the Galavan story was just spot on fantastic. And the second thing uh, I want to rave about is, is the uh, ending of Batman 66, the comic. Um, 
that was like my favorite title. I, I love a lot of what DC is doing, a whole lot actually, and more than I thought I would. But Batman 66 was just so much fun. And that last story where Mike Allred did the art, Allred's art looked just like the characters in the show. And he did many of the poses that those characters do, like the sneer on Bookworm's face is exactly the sneer that Roddy McDowell gives. I mean, it just, it it was a great story. And he even incorporated the opening animation. If you look closely, what Batman does for the trio and all that, um, the theme song animation he incorporated, it is a great, great story. And uh, for those of us who were fans of it, um, Batman she says is not over. Uh, he is meeting up with the man from Uncle right now, and uh, I am purposely saving those until the story ends, so I can wa- read the whole thing at one time. Um, if you, either of you have been reading it, um, I'm just curious to see, think, uh, find out what you think about it. The other thing is, for Christmas I got a statue, a uh, bust of British Meredith Penguin, Frank Gorshin Riddler. Um, Cesar Romero Joker and Otto Preminger Mr. Freeze and these things are amazing they look just like the characters and again they're in poses that the characters would strike in the episode so I went on to Amazon after that and saw that there's an Adam West Batman a Burt Ward Robin a Julie Newmar Catwoman and a Vincent Price Egghead and if you guys like statues and you enjoy Batman 66, man, this this is so worth it because they're so well detailed. And it's from DC's Diamond Select series. So I don't know if you've seen them. Let me know what you think about it. And finally, Supergirl. I watched Blood Blood Ties, the newest Supergirl episode, and it was really, really good. I'm loving this show. I noticed, though, Winslow shot, and I don't know if it was in this episode, actually, because I watched like four of them at a time. Um, Winslow shot, the kid, mentioned that his dad is in prison. And so I'm assuming his dad is Toy Man. And Clark not only showed up in one episode and helped her, but mentioned that he would show up at any time to help her, you know, because they're family. Uh, The whole blood bond thing. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if they maybe ended the season this season with a Supergirl Superman team up? Um, I would love to see Toy Man show up, crossover into the Supergirl universe for just one time uh, appearance or whatever. Maybe even Mixelplick. I love Mr. Mixelplick, and I think he would fit with the tone of the show. Um, but, I mean, how cool would it be to, for Clark to help him and get help her against the Kryptonians or even like bring in Brainiac or somebody. And plus this version of non, I, I love Superman too. And I loved man of steel, but I think this is my favorite version of non this guy. He, he reminds me of the non from the James Robinson, uh, Superman run. If anybody remembers that, but anyway, well, I'm going to long. So here's the deal. What do you guys think? of uh, bringing a Supergirl, Superman team up, and maybe what characters would you put the two of them against? You know. Anyway, thank you very much. Talk to you later. Bye. Let's start first with the Batman 66 stuff. Now, I don't know, do you read the Batman 66 series? Because you don't get the digital-only releases digitally. Am I right on that, Jim? Yeah, I'm not really reading the Batman 66. Okay. Uh and, and to be honest, I read when they first came out, I read them. I thought that was kind of neat, but I was never a hardcore Batman 66 fan. It, it, again, it was one of those things where when it was out, I was watching it, you know, and I was like, yeah, that's kind of neat. But it was it, it was never my jam. It, it was, That's not the thing that brought me to the game. You know, you know, like as I know it is with you and there's a lot of people out there. But for for whatever reason, I thought it was neat as a kid, but it wasn't the thing that pulled me in that had me locked in, you know, for you know, the, the locked into the comic books and locked into the comic universe. So I read the stuff. I thought it was neat, but I never continued because one, 
cost wise and two time wise and all this stuff. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to put that aside. And I, I keep an eye out for when they do trades of it or when they do like a collected edition. I'll probably pick those up maybe. But right now I haven't. Lightning struck because you said you weren't into Batman 66. <laughs> I was like, whoa, what happened there? I'm like, you, what did you say, Jim? You were something you didn't bring you to dance or something? I don't know. Crazy talk. You okay? <laughs> Like, that's blasphemy you're talking about. It's actually, um, I, I read the whole Batman 66 digital series. I'm actually a big fan of DC's digital releases. Uh, what I tend to do with those is um, I, I actually go to dcbservice.com, and it is a cheap plug for them, but I mean, they're, I, I like their portal. I like the fact that, you know, they've been a show sponsor and they've taken really good care of us, and, and Cameron and the whole gang over there has always been so nice when I've met them in person. Uh, I I go to their portal. I I do my shopping through there. I'll go to the DC button, and they always have the digital releases in their own row. So what I do is I grab those, and I like the smaller delivery. You know where it's like a um an epi- like a, a tiny episode each week, and it's cheaper. You know like ninety nine cents. So I like those books, and and one I'm I'm really digging right now is Legends of Wonder Woman. Is is a cool one that's out there. I'm digging the Bombshells one, which is based on that statue series. But it's, it's got some really cool stories that are kind of set in um, a different time era. So it really takes advantage of the whole Elseworlds theme. So it's a lot of fun there. I'm enjoying the Injustice comic. But the one that was like really cool this week, uh, Dark Archer came out. Dark Arrow, Dark Archer, number oh, okay. one. It's written by John Barrowman. Oh, cool. So it's you know it's from the TV series, but it's it's a story of of the Dark Archer. It's written by John Barrowman, so I recommend that a lot if you're a big Arrow fan. The Batman sixty six meets uh, the Man from Uncle. I'm doing the same thing that he's doing. I'm actually just kind of collecting the digital issues, but I'm doing it digitally. So I'm getting the digital pieces, and I'm just kind of waiting until that one's done. I'm just going to kind of sit down and enjoy it and read it uh, the same way. So I'm actually doing the same thing. I've read all of Batman sixty six up to this point, so I really enjoyed that and. I, to take the joking out of it and defend you, I think Batman 66 is either something that um, you got and enjoyed at the time that it was out, or you understood it later, you know, like for the satire that it was. For me, it's kind of interesting, because I'm, I'm re-watching it now gradually. Uh, I ended up getting the um, digital box set, you know, on, the, on, on iTunes, and so I've, I'm watching it that way. And I'm really enjoying just periodically watching the two-parter because usually they were two-parters where, you know, one led into the other with a cliffhanger of some sort. And I'm enjoying it. I'm watching it with a very different lens. I saw all of those as a kid, including when they re-ran them as a kid. There's so much of that I don't remember, yeah. uh, which is a lot of fun. Like, I'm rediscovering it. I get that there was a satire piece. You know what? Here's the funny part, though. With that said, I'm amazed at how much more serious it was than I thought. Like, there's the camp, that the trademark camp that you expect from it. But yet the stories do have a sense of danger to them and and uh, continuity and thought to them. Uh, so And there's some interesting characters and things going on there. I'm really digging it, watching it again from a whole new lens. He mentioned the busts, and I do have the Adam West one, the Adam West Batman bust, and they look really cool. Um, I know that they continued the series. I, I You know what the problem is? I'm getting so many of these statues and things um my office is starting to run out of room so i'm kind of being judicious i got to get the robin one to go with it he actually kind of cued me on that one i'm probably not going to get more in the series not because i don't like them it's just because it's like where am i going to put all this (laughs) (laughs) because i like to display them and i like to enjoy them and i so i'll probably get the robin one put it up there and then you know i just got that uh, which is totally unrelated and i'm taking this on a quick quick little tangent my birthday's coming up this week so I got myself like kind of a birthday gift. The Brad, you, you know the Bradford Exchange. Yeah, they did this cool Star Wars lamp, and it's you know the original Star Wars series, and it's got like three lightsabers that go up and glow. I don't have a lamp in this room. I've got like a light, you know, that's up in the ceiling. But like sometimes, like especially because I play games in here and stuff like that, I want to turn off like the light up top. But I wouldn't mind having a lamp going, you know, because that lamps light a room in a different way. If that makes yeah. any sense, and. Really, this entire justification that you're hearing right now is the, my way of selling it to my wife that I needed this. 
because I'm even like saying to myself, I'm like, do I really believe any of this? I'm saying, no, I really don't. It's really, I just wanted the cool lamp. <laughs> I completely agree with you. I've got the, my Superman leg lamp uh-huh. that uh, my sister got for wait, me. Wait, 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 wait. Did you, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, back up. Did you say Superman leg lamp? Yeah. Like, you know, like the leg lamp from the uh, Christmas story? But you've got the one Superman with, version of it. You got one with a Superman leg? Yeah. Not the rest of them, just the leg. Just the leg. And then it's got the, uh, you know, it's the Superman leg. Then the, uh, the, I think the lamp you're shade pulling. is Wait. the Superman symbol. I think you're pulling my leg. No. You've got such a thing as a Superman leg lamp? Where yes. did you get this thing? Um, My sister got it for me for Christmas. Get out of town. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Um, <laughs> I'm fascinated. I'm doing like a Google search. It's oh my gosh, this really is a thing. Yeah. And there's a Batman leg lamp too. Oh, that looks really cool. Yeah, actually, it's kind of a neat thing. Yeah, you know, I've got it in my, again, it's in my computer room. Describing it like it's something from Christmas Story is probably the worst way to describe it because it puts a weird, <laughs> weird kind of vibe in there of, you know, because that, the leg from the Christmas story is kind of a sexual looking thing. You know, yeah, no, this is not the, uh, no, there's this, no this is nothing. Con- there's no connotation. It's, no. The, it's the Superman leg. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. And, and I mean, and if there is for you, it's great. Go ahead, go for it. But it's like, yeah. <laughs> no, I get it. It's cool. It actually looks really cool. I thought you were, I really did think you were pulling my leg. I'm like, oh, this is another one of Jim's kind of weird <laughs> jokes. <laughs> and I, I really thought you were like, and, and I'm like, I'm falling for this. I don't know if I should be. <laughs> so I started lo- here the show. Here's the thing. You had me sold enough that I was looking. Yeah. Um, it does look cool. That's a yeah. nice gift. Yeah, there's. A, it's funny. There's a whole um, line of leg lamps uh-huh. you know, of different type of uh, characters out there. I think there's a you know, Wizard of Oz Dorothy with the ruby red slippers and the Superman, the Batman. There's very other leg lamps out there. They're yeah. all trying to take it. They're all trying to captivate off of the uh, the toy st- the not toy st- uh, Christmas story. <laughs> yeah, not at all what I expected, but very very cool. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh, and then the other thing, what did he ask about uh, besides that? He asked if, if we were um, Supergirl and oh, uh, yeah. Superman team up, what team up would we do? Do you have well, one? See, well, first off, I don't think I don't think we'll really ever get a Superman, Supergirl team up. And I, I wish they would. I agree with him. I think it'd be neat to have an actor who is this is this universe is Superman. I don't think they'll make that commitment. You know, because you think about it, how they first they mentioned him and then they had a quick blurry version of him. They didn't really show, you know, any good solid da da da. Here he is. So I can't see them making that final commitment. But if they were to do it, um, I would say I like the Brainiac thing. I really do like that. I think I think that would be kind of a neat that a way they could do it is he's invading Earth. You know, and it's the the two have to team up to take him down. You know, another way they could do it. See, you you, you to the care to the power levels is something, but I yeah I think Brainiac probably is going to be your best bet on that. Or I want to I would say Dark Side, but I think that would take way too much explaining to do for the TV universe. I think Brainiac wouldn't be as Difficult to explain then because Darkseid himself has this whole massive lore to him, you know, and in a way, Darkseid is always Superman's main enemy, not not to hers. And so it, it would be kind of a, a hard uh, sell on that or it wouldn't be a hard sell. It would be a, a difficult sell. So I think, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I would love to see it, too. Uh, just because I think it would be kind of a neat thing. I mean, in some ways we've already seen it because of the fact that uh, Superman's kind of zipped in and out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know where what they're going to do if if we'll eventually su- see Superman at some point. I would love for it to be this movie Superman, even just a cameo. I think it'd be cool. I, I don't think we're going to see it on the show. I wish we would. I honestly, uh, here's the thing. I have no problem with there being one Superman in the movie and a different Superman on TV. I really have yeah. zero issue with that at all. And I have no issue with them implying that it's all connected. Good. Go ahead. It doesn't matter if a different actor plays it on TV. You can still connect those stories. I'm I'm old enough that I can use my imagination. Um, so let's go ahead and do that and tell me a great story. I would love to see that at some point. I really would. I think you got to be careful about doing that just because... 
I think one of the keys of it is getting to know Supergirl and really getting to like Supergirl. And I really do like the actress playing Supergirl. I think is doing a great job. The scripts are excellent. Um, it started slow for me where I was kind of feeling it out. And as we went forward, I've become a real big fan of the show. I think it's, I, well, are you, where are you at? Are you digging that show? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm a fan of this show. And it, it's like you, you said with, you know, getting the groove and to get the feel for it. It's funny. My, uh, my sister and my mom, both, will uh both watch it and and they like the show so it's again it's one of those things where non-comic book uh, people are watching it you know and enjoying it and you know they're seeing it because of the the actress was was in a couple different stuff and you know so that they know you know I, i can't think what show she was on but she was on one show that you know they watched so you know they're following her in that did you like it out of the gate I mean, or or is it, were you more like me? Like I, I didn't dis, I never disliked it. Don't get me wrong on that one. Uh, the first couple episodes, I was kind of wrapping my head around the premise and the direction they were going in. Then once I, it was like episode three. I'm kind of like, oh, you know, I'm, I think I really like this. <laughs> and and I'm now I'm a big fan. I'm I'm a real big fan of the show. But it wasn't immediate for me, and I, I never disliked it. But I wasn't like through the roof with it until I think about episode three. I don't know what your journey was. Yeah, I, I liked it out of the gate. Yeah. You know, right from the start. I liked it. I thought, okay, this is cool. You know, it, you know, it did probably, you know, two, maybe three when I'm really like, okay, yeah, this is good. Okay, yes. We're good here. I'm comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with this story. I'm comfortable with what they're telling. Cause for me, I'm always, I was worried how and what they were going to do, how you know, it just like, the portray her portrayal, but not only her portrayal, the universe portrayal, because it it is a standalone show. Yeah, you know, whereas with Arrow had Arrow and Flash, and then soon Legends of Tomorrow, and you know now Constantine has been put into that universe. They're building this whole because the DC universe is awesome. Yeah. DC titles are great, but the universe is just something more. So when you have the standalone show. There's always going to be that concern. It's like kind of like how with Gotham. Gotham's this fabulous show, but it is a really a standalone show. So I, I, I you know, so yeah. Supergirl has a lot of the same behind the scenes production people as Arrow and Flash. So I think there's a, there's a little something there. I love you know what a character I love in there. I, they're, they're casting of Jimmy Olsen, yeah, and Win. I think are great. Hank Henshaw's great. The sister. Is fantastic. um, Cat Grant is amazing. Uh, I think just the whole thing works. It's it's really got a great supporting cast, and and there's a lot, a lot of legs for the show or leg lamps. (laughs) Look at it. I really do like the show a lot. Um, So I don't really have. I get you know what part of the problem is. I think we've gone off on this tangent because it's kind of hard to think of a team up that you want when you can't vision the team up. (laughs) Right. But if you would, if, let's go. Let's go to a dream on it. If let's say they were to put any one of the recent Superman actors, like what it, Tom Welling goes on, and because that was a, a April Fool's joke, I think, or something, that Tom Welling was going to be on as Superman. <laughs> I don't know if it was or wasn't, but I thought I read that somewhere, and it turned out to be bunk or something like that. But um, it, it, let's say Tom Welling were to go on and and be Superman on that. Who would you like to see Supergirl and Superman team up against? Like, what would be your ultimate dream team? Well, see, first off, with her, the Superman for her, I would say Dean Kane personally. But that's Dad on the show, right? I know, I know, but I, I want that kind of age difference, is what I'm saying. No, but that's Dad on the show. Yeah, I know. So it can't be okay. It can't be Dean Kane. All right, but but Tom Welling, you are aware. Difference. You are aware. Tom Welling's older now. See, I still keep picturing in my Smallville, head. <laughs> Smallville's been off the show a little bit. I mean, it's, oh, yeah, it has been a while. Yeah, like, so like Tom Welling didn't do, they didn't like freeze him or something. It's like, <laughs> like, like the show went off the air and Tom Welling kept aging. So, I mean, he's like, you know, he is a little older now, but he's not, in fairness to you, he's not as old as Dean Cain. You know, Dean Cain right. came back from, so, I mean, there, it, I'm, I'm joking. Um, so you, you would like him to be significantly older yeah i think I'd, I'd like for this universe i think you know a significant older superman but uh, yeah 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 i, I don't know because <laughs> you think about it when she first landed he was already superman he was already an adult 
So for her, her aging process and all that stuff, there you're going to have to have that big of a gap of a thing. But to be honest, Tom Welling probably is the correct age for that I'm thinking in my head because again, I'm thinking Dean Cain age of that he was when he played uh, Lois and Clark Superman, not the current age of Dean. So <laughs> my, my universe is kind of skewed. Okay, so probably Tom Welling is probably the correct age is what I'm thinking in my head, mm-hmm. unless they did in fact freeze him. Yeah, unless they did, in fact, freeze them. But, you know, hey, you, know, you never know. But, um, <laughs> um, okay, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> team up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we still haven't gotten there yet. Right. Um, if you were to have a dream team up, like, let's say, let's say they did something horrible to Tom Welling to make him age to the point where he's where you need him to be. Right. Who would you like to see him team up with? Like, they break out his walker. They hand it to him and say, put on the Superman suit again. What would you like to see him, uh, who would you like to see him fight alongside Supergirl? Besides an escalator. What? Besides an escalator because he's having trouble walking. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) I'm telling you right now, this isn't a, a visual podcast this is just audio so you Uh, can't tell but right now i'm saying you're number one sean okay that's great i love it i love you too (laughs) (laughs) no um you know what i was thinking what's that sonny you got to speak up yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) here would be a neat way to have them be a team up Uh uh-huh brainiac we go back to that brainiac invasion he's Mm -hmm. invading metropolis okay and clark calls her for backup okay and she's got to fly into Metropolis to save the day. Oh, I think that would be a neat story. It'd be and that would be a neat her way. In- and then in, in the most of the episode would be her. And then at the final end, she frees him, and the two of them are side by side. And you have the final fight sequence. I like that. I actually really like that. I that's like how that. I, that's how. So I she like comes to his. Plan. She comes to his rescue, and it's kind of a validation that she exactly. Has. She saves the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, does Brainiac have to be older? <laughs> you know, I got a feeling that this is never going to end. <laughs> this is going to be one of those ongoing ones. I'm just where asking. Every so often, you're going to throw out. Now, do you want it to be older? <laughs> I'm just asking. I don't know. Like, does Brainiac's age have to be significantly older than Supergirl's because of the fact that Superman will now be older? Right. Or does the fact that Brainiac shape changes mean that it's okay for him to be the age that he is now? Well, um, see, I think Brainiac needs to be an ageless kind of face. Okay. So So Brainiac really doesn't have an age. Does he have to be the same actor from Smallville if we're using Tom Welling? Or are you okay with it being different Brainiac? Do you want it to look more like the comic book Brainiac? I would say more like the comic book Brainiac. Okay. Because I'm trying to remember who did the Smallville Brainiac. What if Dean Cain were to play Brainiac? Well, he can't now. Why? You put because him in he's the dad. Oh, that's true. What if her dad is Brainiac? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Actually, um, playing Brainiac, mm-hmm. you know, you'd have to do some makeup and some changing the, the appearance and whatnot. But um, what's his name? Who played uh, uh, John, Snyder, John Snyder, who played Paul Kent? Yeah. I think he would look cool. You know, you'd have to give him the uh, the alien look, the techno look, you know, the the Brainiac look to him. But I think that'd be kind of neat seeing him play Brainiac. I do too, actually. Uh, I don't. I'm a, I'm actually a fan. T- taking the joking out of it, like I loved that Tom Welling was on there. I love that Helen Slater was on there. I like when they do nods to the history of those programs. I like what they did with the Flash, where they had the da- the the free John Wesley ships. If I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, he I liked that Flash series a great deal. I liked that she was on there. I liked that they brought back Tina McGee from that series. You know those little nods and things to show that the you know this guy, fans like do keep their own continuity on what media looks like that connects with this. I like when they do that kind of stuff. So I would love uh, people from Smallville to appear on Supergirl. You got to be careful with that. You got to be judicious in how you use them. You know, in the sense that you don't want to overdo that and then lose kind of the show's identity. Right. But with the way they've done it so far, I think it's been really great on these shows. Uh, the right the right kind of people are being brought in at the right times. I can't wait to see more of what they're doing. I Honestly, I don't have an idea of my own because uh, I'm really stuck on your Brainiac idea, which I think is super cool. 
I actually really like that. I like the idea of her finally going to yeah. Metropolis and saving Superman. I think that would be the move. I, here's the thing. I don't know that it has to be Brainiac, except the only reason why I like the idea of Brainiac, you, I think you deliberately chose Brainiac because of the power levels, and it makes sense that that would be the kind of villain that Superman would need help with. So it just kind of – it's a fitting story, and I actually – quite agree with that i actually like that better than doing lex luthor just because it seems kind of like you always go to lex luthor brainiac's like kind of a different sort of one with the traditional dc look to him would be really cool yeah did you watch that red tornado episode of supergirl no i don't think i have okay i won't say anything about that one yeah we gotta watch we'll have to talk about that one after you do yeah i'm a little bit behind on uh with uh, supergirl the holidays kind of caught up on me yeah he mentioned that he watched a, a couple of them in a row and yeah. I end up doing that with that one just because – you know what the problem I'm having right now? Between all the comics I'm reading and all the shows that I like on – like I'm a big Shannara fan, Terry Brooks, Shannara. That's on MTV now. I'm watching that show. I got too many geek culture shows, and I love that. You know, uh, They got the Jessica Jones show that I'm finally getting caught up That was on Netflix. That was a really good comic-related show. Agent Carter's coming back soon, and I really liked the first season. Uh, you know, we got all the DC shows, great Marvel shows. Uh, it's like a, it's too much. Yeah. And, and no, and let me clarify. I don't want any of it to go away. I like the fact that when seasons are done, I've got episodes of other shows to get caught up on. So I get them all in. So during, you know, your traditional rerun time, there's always stuff for me to watch relating to comic book culture and they're all good. It's really just great material. I love that they're being treated with such reverence, but also an understanding of the medium they're trying to put them on. This is, are you finding like you've got way too many shows to watch now? Oh, big time. It's, <clears throat> I've got all the, all the comic related shows that I watch and I'm actually avoiding the Marvel shows, even though they're good, just because I've got so many stuff out there now. I, I've got all my gold Wait shows. Wait a minute. Hold on. We got I got to stop you right there. Are you telling okay. me you have not seen Daredevil? I have not seen Daredevil. I haven't oh. seen Jones. I haven't seen Agent Carter. Oh. I stopped watching Agents of Shield. Oh. I, I I can't. I, I I just it's a it's a it's one of those things where I'm just I'm drawing the line right there. <laughs> <laughs> More lightning, huh? <laughs> Jim, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> Daredevil's awesome. I honestly, I I'm, a, I'm a huge Daredevil fan, and they're doing Iron Fist, I think, on Netflix, too. I, th- I heard that they're doing that next. It's like two of my favorites. They did Daredevil and did an incredible justice, and they did, they're doing Iron Fist, I believe. I heard that's Iron Fist. Gosh, I hope that's right, because uh, that's one. If there's one geek dream I had is that they would do an Iron Fist series, Daredevil, I'd do a Daredevil right was was a good one. Although I liked the Affleck film, the Daredevil one. The director's cut in Affleck. Yeah. The, the director's cut in particular. Did you see the director's cut version? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I, I that's a movie I, I really quite enjoyed. But um in fairness, and this is not throwing the Affleck film under the bus, but if there's Daredevil perfection, it's that Netflix T V series. Oh my gosh, the pacing and everything. Season two's coming out soon. I cannot wait. Netflix is doing like some really good material right now with that Marvel stuff. Um, I actually, I will say this, I really enjoy Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so this is not knocking it, but the Netflix stuff coming out, the Marvel output on Netflix is, like, through the roof uh, better. I really thought Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was a really good show that I was really enjoying. I love the fact that I flipped on Netflix, I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, Daredevil gives Arrow and Flash the run for their money. Oh, cool. It's that level of quality, and that's not diminishing from my boys. It's I'll take more, your word for it because yeah. I'm not going to do that to myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have enough shows, and I'm trying to thin my herd on my the shows I'm watching. But it's you know, you know I'm like ah, ah, you know, and then I'm trying to find time to read, and I'm trying to find time to go see movies. You know, it's. <laughs> You okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. All right. have, you, have you seen Star Wars yet? No. <laughs> Did you watch Ant-Man? No. 
<laughs> you gotta have like a leak in your house. <laughs> <laughs> Ant Man's fantastic. Um, did you see Guardians of the Galaxy? Oh god, yeah. Oh yeah. All right. And uh, Age of Ultron, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so you don't, yeah, we'll have to worry about that. All right, all right. Uh, oof. <laughs> worried about you over there. Jessica Jones is fantastic, too. That's another Netflix one. <laughs> <laughs> just just, just, just my silence was enough of an answer. <laughs> But I, it, all that Netflix stuff, I don't really, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I don't know. I don't have a Netflix account. You know what you do with Netflix? Hang on. Gotta put an umbrella up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what you do with that Netflix stuff? The nice part about Netflix and those type of things is that's a great thing to do, like in the off season. Like when the shows aren't like up and running, like our, our Arrow and Flash and stuff like that, like uh, summer months is like a, probably a good time to do Netflix because you can sign up for that and just do like a month and then just watch because the um, Daredevil is only like 13 episodes. So it's a, sh- you know, it's a short show, but it's a compressed storyline. I really would recommend it. It's something that, now, I mean, obviously right now is to your point, it's really hard for you to get that in right now. But um, when when like the rerun season's in and you're like I'm all caught up on everything I'm looking for something to watch do like Netflix for like a month or two and just binge watch like Daredevil and because uh, Daredevil season two will be out by then so you could actually get a full season like what would be a traditional full season of a TV show and get caught up on Daredevil and I would watch Jessica Jones too they're really good really really good um, I, I would give that a high recommendation of like something you need to watch um, okay right so. We'll go from there. <laughs> How do we get on that? <laughs> I have no idea. Superman should team up with Supergirl to take on Daredevil and Jessica Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I got money on the Kryptonians. All right. Well, I do too, but it'd still be cool. I would like to, yeah, I'd like to see that. That'd be good. All right. <laughs> Remember our show voicemail line, if you want to go through this again, is 1440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you part of the show. <laughs> Holy caffeine. I want to remind everyone about our website, RagingBullets.com, where you'll find out about show releases. It does link into our Twitter account, so if you are more of a Twitter fan, go ahead and follow us on Twitter. We have a Facebook fan page. We also have an amazing Facebook group community, and I just love the people there. It's really their community. If you've never joined a Facebook group community before, I really highly recommend joining this one. A lot of times, I know that one of the reluctances of people joining Facebook group communities is the fact that you kind of get inundated with emails. You can control the emails, so be sure to go into the settings, turn off any email notifications that you don't want. That way you can enjoy the group, pop in for the discussion wherever you feel like it, and don't feel like you're being bombarded in your email account when you go ahead and do that. But it's a great community filled with great people, and it's really their community, and I'm just proud that our show has any association with that group. We do share it with InfiniteComics.com, but it's it's the quality people there that maintain that. I feel like I'm always visiting a group of friends when I go there and and the beauty of it is um they really have made that a must stop destination the conversations are always topical the references they'll put up links to all kinds of news and events that are going on that's really just my first stop to kind of see hey what's going on right now they talk about everything across comics television games you name it movies everything that you're into um the, the crew over there they are really just amazing in talking about it. So I just want to shout out again the quality people over in that group. We also have Google Plus pages. Uh, really, basically, we're on social media to make you aware of what's going on with our show because we value you. Mr. Segulin, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com are supporting our show. Can you please tell me what's going on at DCBService.com? We've got a wonderful bundle. Issue number 50s are out, and they are giving us a great 50% off on all the uh, number 50, issue number 50 titles that are out. Uh, 50% off, only 27.39 plus. 
<laughs> Plus, we've got a conti- they're continuing the supporting of the new Vertigo series. Um, 13 new issues that are coming out. Also, 50% off all 30 issues. That's cool. Only 25 87 I really think that's cool that they're doing that with the Vertigo series just because – you know, they're new titles. Um, it's it's a new line. I'm glad they're supporting them because some great creators have really put together some books there. And that's a great way to allow people a chance to, hey, let me try these out for a while and see how they work for me. I hope people keep getting them because I think this relaunch is highly successful. And remember to link your digital accounts over there, uh, whether it's Comixology or MyDigitalComics.com. Uh, I, every month, really enjoy the fact that when I go to order something from DCBService.com, I can tack on that nice little bonus for things that I'm already purchased. And so I highly recommend that you do that and shop through that portal. InStockTrades.com has some really cool stuff over there. I actually want to shout out something. This one's a guilty pleasure of mine. It's something that I really love. Archer and Armstrong, uh, it's a complete classic omnibus. It's the classic Valiant series collected in an omnibus format. It's 30% off, only $69.99. The artistic talent, including Barry Windsor Smith, that is on this book is just staggering. It's 736 pages. If you are an, a longtime fan of Archer and Armstrong or have never touched it before, this is really the way to get it. It's really terrific material, and, and I can't recommend it highly enough, so I wanted to shout that one out. Uh, besides that, remember to check out the deals of the week, and they also have Flash Trade Paperback Volume 6, because I did announce that Volume 7 is over there. You can also get Volume 6 in Trade Paperback format, 45% off, only nine thirty four. So there's a lot of just great deals constantly going on over at InStockTrades.com. And I want to thank, thank both of those companies for supporting our show. Jim, our next episode, let's talk TV shows. Yeah. Why don't we, do, we started to do it a little bit, dab a little bit on this episode. Why don't we do kind of a, a TV catch-up to what's going on at DC TV? and talk about uh, all of the programs that are out there right now, what we're digging and what we're enjoying. So we will see you next episode. Bye! On November 13th, Sean Whalen was asked to stop constantly talking about comic books. That request came from his wife. Deep down, he knew she was right, but he also knew that someday he would find someone that would talk to him. With nowhere else to go, he appeared at the home of his childhood friend, Jim Segulin. Sometime earlier, Segulin's boss had requested that he shut up about his comic books and never speak of them again. Can two grown men put out a DC Comics podcast without driving each other crazy? It's Raging Bullets, the DC Comics fan podcast. With Sean Whalen as Dr. Norge. And Jim Segulin as the Sensei of the Whatnot and the Duke of You Know. It's a spoiler podcast, so they will go in depth into the plot line, story twists, and whatnot of the comics they are reviewing. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you may better enjoy the show.